23, bust, the dealer says before scooping up the cards from in front of the man who appears to be growing increasingly angry as his stack of chips increasingly dwindles in size. Making matters worse for the man are the cheers of excitement coming from the nearby craps table, where it seems all of the luck that he has lost has somehow been transported. As the blackjack dealer once again reveals an ace and a king, another burst of noise comes from the craps game. Seven again, the croupier cries before placing a huge stack of chips in front of the young man playing craps who seemingly can't lose. The young man on the hot streak collects his winnings and walks happily through the crowded casino floor right past the fuming man at the blackjack table. The young man cashes in his chips and counts the large stack of $100 bills given to him before tipping one to the woman working inside the cage. And this night is far from a rarity for this young man. For his entire life, it's been as if he couldn't lose. He's not strong, fast, or especially smart, but he's always managed to excel thanks to his one incredible gift, his never-ending good luck. The young man soon recognized his ability to consistently beat games of chance and went to the one place in the world best suited for his skills, Las Vegas. And Vegas has been very, very good to him. He lives in an expensive hotel room right on the strip, drives fancy cars, and treats himself nightly to lavish dinners and shows. It's all possible because no matter what the game is, it's as if he can never lose. The young man is in the middle of another hot streak, or rather, continuing his never-ending hot streak, this time at the roulette table. How does he keep doing it? Someone in the crowd asks as the man hits another number straight up, paying out 37 to 1 on his bet. The crowd cheers and slaps the man on his back as a crowd is formed who are following along with his every bet, piggybacking on his luck as much as they can. The man is just about to place another large bet when he's suddenly interrupted by a strong hand gripping his upper arm. The young man turns to find a large, toothy grin staring back at him. The smiling man continues to hold on to the young man's arm as he explains how impressed the casino is with his skill. He must be the luckiest man they've ever had the pleasure to have visited their casino, and the fact that he's been able to sustain that same run of luck night after night has been truly awe-inspiring. The young man thanks him for his kind words and tries to turn back to the table, but finds that the man won't let go of his arm, gripping it even tighter now than before. We've been so impressed, in fact, the man tells him, that the owners of this casino have requested the chance to meet with you. The young man looks down at the huge, powerful hand holding his arm, and even though he's unaware that it belongs to a former heavyweight contender, he's still able to recognize that this request isn't an optional one. Sure. The young man tells him, just let me grab my chips and… But the man begins to pull him away from the table, telling him that there's no need to worry, the casino will take care of his winnings. After all, we have cameras everywhere. Who would steal? The young man is soon pushed through a doorway into a space that looks like a police interrogation room, with just a single table and a couple of chairs, one of which a small, older man is sitting in. The ex-boxer wrenches the young man's arm down onto the table and holds it in place there. The young man screams as the boxer grabs a hammer with his free hand and raises it into the air, ready to bring it down on the young man's fingers. Well? The old man sitting across from him asks. The young man has started to cry a little, but between whimpers he manages to ask, well what? The old man wants to know how the young man is cheating. No one wins the way he does, over and over, night after night, no matter the game. The young man insists that he isn't cheating, he's just lucky, he always has been, but the old man isn't buying it. He nods to the boxer, who raises the hammer up again, but still the young man doesn't admit to anything. I'm just lucky, I'm just lucky, he keeps repeating over and over in between sobs. The old man stands up and pats him on the shoulder. Maybe you are, he says, before slipping something into the man's pocket. The police then enter the room and immediately take a set of loaded dice from the same pocket. He's in real trouble now. The young man is shoved into a holding cell at the jail and looks around at the other men, wondering if his luck has finally run out. He squeezes in on one of the benches lining the wall and accidentally bumps the man sitting next to him, waking him up from his nap. The man is angry at having been disturbed, but grows even angrier when he realizes who just woke him. It's the man who seemed to take all the luck. The young man doesn't seem to have noticed that he's upset at him at all, though. What he has noticed is that there's a penny on the floor in front of him. The young man bends to pick it up just as the man next to him throws a haymaker. His fist slams into the wall right where the young man's head just was, shattering many of the bones in his hand. The young man jumps up with a fright and runs across the small cell as the other men being held also leap to their feet, some crying out in confusion, others cheering on the violence. The young man cries out to the guards for help, but no one seems to be coming to his aid. He looks around the cell, but there's nowhere for him to hide. 
The angry man, now madder than ever with a hand that is rapidly turning purple and blue, approaches him. He lifts the young man up with his good hand, holding him in the air by his throat. I'm gonna kill you, the man cries before the door to the cell opens. The young man watches as the taser prongs fired by the jail guards appear on the man's chest, and he drops the young man to the floor before falling backwards from the 50,000 volts coursing through his body. The young man would learn the next day that the angry man was dead before he even hit the floor, the result of a congenital heart defect and a lot of bad luck. The young man stands before a judge who is listing off the charges against him, which include cheating, a felony in this state that can result in a sentence of up to five years in prison. But this isn't your first offense, is it? The judge asks. The young man tries to explain that those previous times were all mistakes, he's never cheated in his life, but the judge doesn't want to hear it. The young man is sitting in the hallway outside the courtroom when his lawyer emerges from his meeting with the judge and prosecutor. Or are you a lucky guy, his lawyer tells him. He goes on to explain that even though the case against him is airtight, the charges are going to be dropped, provided he admits himself to a special program. The young man assumes it must be some kind of gambling addiction program. In no way is he addicted to gambling, but what choice does he have? It's either that or prison. The choice is easy. As the young man exits the courthouse, he is approached by a man in a suit who leads him to a black van parked nearby. The young man is placed in the back and immediately notices that there is a cage separating the back from the front seat, like a prison transport van. The young man is growing nervous. Where are they taking him? This all seems like it's happening so fast. Can it even be legal? And what about his things that were taken at the jail? Excuse me, he asks the driver. What about my things? I don't even have my wallet. Don't worry about that, the man driving the van tells him. You won't need any of that anymore. You're D-class now. The man doesn't have any idea what that means, but he can tell it isn't good. His luck may have finally ran out. The young man, who once lived the life of a professional Las Vegas gambler, was given a new name, D87465. But as you'll see, that name wouldn't last very long, and soon would be known as SCP-181, or as the SCP Foundation staff like to refer to him, Lucky. SCP-181 was first noticed by the Foundation following his being arrested for repeatedly defrauding the Nevada Gaming Commission. He was originally made a member of the Foundation's Class D personnel, the guinea pigs of the SCP Foundation who are used for various tests with anomalies in order to better understand their properties. However, it soon became clear that the man's ability to consistently beat the odds had nothing to do with cheating. In his first experiment, which took place at Armed Reliquary Containment Area 02, where he and several other Class Ds were exposed to an SCP that is known to incite extreme anger and murderous tendencies in those who come into contact with it, just as expected, one of the other D-Class members became enraged and began rampaging, killing all of the other Class Ds present, all except for one. Through what appeared to be a stroke of good luck, the frenzying D-Class seemed to miss D87465, who had laid down on the ground amongst the other bodies and was playing dead. An armed response team soon entered the experimentation cell and put down the rampaging D-Class, sparing D87465. He was next submitted to a test with SCP-075, a creature that resembles a large snail with a muscular foot shaped like a six-fingered clawed hand. SCP-075 is much heavier than its small size makes it seem like it should, weighing approximately 860 kilograms. Despite this, it is able to move at an extremely high speed, quickly leaping towards anyone who comes near it and spraying them with a deadly corrosive liquid. D-87465 was placed in a cell with SCP-075 as part of a test to measure its speed and reaction time. But despite SCP-075 having immediately killed all other prior D-classes during tests, D-87465 somehow managed to keep avoiding its leaping attacks. He was always able to guess which direction to move in order to dodge the deadly snail, like a soccer goalie who always picks the right way to dive to stop penalty kicks. Having now survived not one, but two experiments that exposed him to Keter-class anomalies, researchers needed to find out if D-87465 was himself anomalous or simply a statistical anomaly. In order to test this, the D-class was placed in the containment cell of SCP-082, better known to most as Fernand the Cannibal, a grotesquely huge humanoid with ogre-like features who often dresses like a Victorian-era aristocrat and will regale his guests with outlandish stories before inevitably eating them. But there was something different about D-87465. After a full month of survival in 082's cell, a length of time that had resulted in all the previous test subjects being consumed, SCP researchers suspected that this D-class's incredible ability to survive was much more than dumb luck. 
but they needed to test him even more to see if his powers extended beyond just the ability to survive. D-87465 was removed from regular D-Class duties, and researchers began performing various tests on him, watching as he flipped a coin 50 times in a row, with it coming up heads every single time. Similar results occurred when they had him roll pairs of dice that would always total up to seven, or when they had him pick random cards out of a deck, and he was able to pull all 13 hearts in a row. Foundation researchers were now convinced that this man was more than just lucky. He seemed to possess the ability to create an unnatural effect on probability. The researchers suspected that he was generating this effect without being aware of it. At this point, D-87465 was reclassified and given a new designation, SCP-181. Further testing confirmed that SCP-181 is able to affect causal probability and that it really does occur through no action of his own. However, there's more to SCP-181 than simply being lucky, as researchers soon found out. In an audit of death and injury rates at Bioresearch Area 12, where SCP-181 is contained, it was discovered that both had increased dramatically in the time since he was brought there. It seems that SCP-181 doesn't simply create his own good luck. He, in some ways, saps it from others simply by being present. It now appears that every lucky moment he experiences results in the opposite happening to someone else. For every seven he rolls on a pair of dice, someone else gets snake eyes. And for every death-defying escape he makes, someone else must die. There's no telling how far his ability might scale. Could he survive a nuclear blast? And if he did, what would be the result in order to even out the odds, so to speak? In light of these new discoveries, SCP-181 was removed from his low-level containment cell where he was allowed to occasionally interact with D-Class personnel for entertainment purposes and was moved to Site-27, where he was placed in solitary confinement and classified as safe. All interactions with staff are now limited to the bare minimum in order to ensure his survival and security, without risking any events that might result in him getting lucky. A kindly-looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall, and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. he just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed, and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seemed to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman, after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents and there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor, only it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, 
unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Tembi, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local school children singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. 
Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools, as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back, as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo, before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses, and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings, and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area, and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too. And as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers, they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest, when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant, white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree, where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site, since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck there was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much, D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. 
Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembi in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembi Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site 5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. A child is sleeping happily in their bed, dreaming of Christmas morning. What they don't hear, as they sleep, is the sound of SCP-4666 slipping into their room. SCP-4666 watches the child for just a moment before reaching into a giant bag. Hi. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man. SCP-4666 is thought to be a single humanoid entity, but one that has been alive for an incredibly long time. Those who have come into contact with SCP-4666 and live to tell the tale describe him as being very tall, between 2 and 2.3 meters. He also appears to be very old and very thin. He always appears without clothing, even when the weather is below freezing and would be much too cold for any normal human to survive. Though the true extent of his anomalous properties are still unknown, SCP-4666 seems to be able to travel instantaneously to any location on Earth above the 40th line of North Latitude, and may actually be able to travel anywhere on the planet. Encounters with SCP-4666 have only been reported during a very specific time of year, a period of 12 nights running from the night of December 21st to the early morning hours of January 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase, and the encounters with the anomalous humanoid creature have been termed Weissnacht events. During these events, SCP-4666 appears at family dwellings, all of which, so far, have a few things in common. 1. They are all isolated in rural areas. 2. They are in locations with snow that covers the area for the duration of the event. And 3. They are all home to a family with at least one child under the age of 8. In places that match all of those characteristics, Weissnacht events sometimes occur and always follow the same basic progression. During the first seven nights, the children will report seeing a strange figure within the vicinity of the home. The entity will seem to be watching the home from a distance, such as from across a field or from the edge of a nearby forest. Some children have even reported waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. On nights 8 through 11, other family members will report hearing the entity, such as footsteps on the roof or in the attic. A bad-smelling odor will also start to be noticed in the house, but no source of the smell is ever found. These strange occurrences will often lead the family to think their house may be haunted, or that they're being terrorized by a madman. Finally, on the twelfth night, one of two scenarios can occur. In the first, which happens roughly 15% of the time, Families will often report that they heard footsteps during the night inside of their house, but there is never any sign of forced entry like broken windows or doors. In the morning, the children will find crudely made toys at the foot of their beds. For the lucky ones, this is the end of the Weissnacht event for them. The roughly 85% who experience the other scenario are considerably less lucky. In the vast majority of cases, the twelfth night is a horrible experience. SCP-4666 still enters the home on the final night, but rather than leave presents for the children, it incapacitates the family and moves them all into a single room where it proceeds to kill them one by one in view of the rest of the family. The exact method of killing varies from event to event, 
but there's almost always an element of torture that occurs before they are finally killed. And this torture may serve a ritualistic purpose. The entire family is killed except for one of the children who is under the age of eight. This child is instead abducted and placed into a giant bag SCP-4666 carries with it. SCP-4666's existence was first noted in 1974 by the Foundation's then new Anomalous Signature Recognition Program, which alerted the Foundation to several suspiciously similar home invasions and murders that occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere on the night of January 1st. Further research uncovered evidence for what was most likely other Weissnacht events every single year, dating back all the way to the late 18th century, with there being, on average, a little more than three events per year. And there's even been evidence of references to what may be SCP-4666, dating all the way back to the 1st and 2nd century AD. Identical fingerprints have been found at all of the houses which match the conditions for Weissnacht events, and have been matched to a recovered partial print from all the way back in 1873. These fingerprints have characteristics that don't match any known human fingerprints, and the human-like white hairs that have also been recovered do not appear to contain human DNA, or any DNA at all for that matter. In the rare Weissnacht events where SCP-4666 does not murder the family and gifts are left behind, the gifts are anything but normal. The gifts, known as SCP-4666-As, appear to be made from the bodies of children that SCP-4666 abducted from other homes. In one case, from 2018, at the home of a family in Alaska, a life-size doll made from the body of a female child was left behind. The doll was wearing a dirty dress made from sewn-together rags that was in some places sewn directly to the skin. Her mouth had been sewn shut and painted red with human blood. Another child's fingernails had been glued over her own, and three fingers were missing completely. The scalp had also been replaced with another child's scalp and hair like a crude wig. Worst of all, both eyes had been removed and replaced with two stones which were painted to look like eyes. But most frightening of all was that the child who had been turned into a doll was somehow still alive. Authorities took the girl to a hospital where she was able to give a brief interview. She explained that the man who abducted her had killed her parents before putting her into a giant bag where there were other children too. SCP-4666 took the children somewhere deep below the earth in a cave system full of ice and bones. There, they were forced to make crude toys until they couldn't go on any longer, at which point they became toys. The girl, now known to be Ekaterina Morozova, had been abducted two years previously in a known Weissnacht event. She survived for only 18 hours after being discovered. An autopsy revealed many terrible injuries and the cause of death was found to be from severe, sustained malnourishment. SCP-4666 has been classified as Keter and is currently not contained. The Foundation monitors web traffic and law enforcement channels for any evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and especially any potential Weissnacht events, such as cases of stalking reported during the 12-night active phase or other strange phenomena at houses with young children. Should a Weissnacht event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is dispatched to attempt to contain SCP-4666 using the standard PDP-8 humanoid first contact protocols. So far, no such containment attempt has been successful. Hello everyone, Dr. Bob here. I know you're not used to seeing me here at the start of videos, but that's because today we have an extremely pressing matter to attend to. One that cuts to the deepest core of one of the SCP Foundation's deadliest contained anomalies, SCP-096, the Shy Guy. It's a creature that needs no introduction, because it probably haunts all of your nightmares already. Close your eyes and picture it in your mind's eye, that gaunt face with the slack jaw and the lifeless white eyes. The face you hope never to see as long as you live, the pale skin pulled tight against bone those impossibly long, gangly limbs. It sits there in its airtight containment cube, covering its face and quietly sobbing, always sobbing, as though cursing something beyond even its own understanding. Perhaps, when thinking about SCP-096, you feel a pang of sympathy mixed with the terror. 
After all, this anomaly is no sadist. Why would a sadist cry as it kills, like SCP-096 does? You're not alone in asking this question. I've spent many a night poring over classified files with an ever-freshening pot of coffee, trying to piece together the answers. SCP-096 is considered one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures in containment, and yet, so little about it is known, beyond its capability to do great harm whenever someone is unlucky enough to see its face and send it into its rage state. How did this happen? It's a question for the curious, like you or me, and after months of strenuous research, I believe I may have an answer. Whether you choose to believe it is up to you. Just be warned, when you hear what I believe to be the heartbreaking, tragic origin of this terrifying and pitiful monster, you may never be able to look at him the same way again. Not that looking at him should ever be high on your list of priorities. It begins in a tavern in a small Nepalese village a few miles away from the Chinese border, where Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain above sea level, waits. Its mere existence is like a challenge to the brave and foolhardy. Conquer me, it seems to whisper. Conquer me and declare yourself above all those I have conquered. Become a god among men. It's always whispering like this, but few, in the grand scheme of things, can actually hear it. And sadly for him, the explorer is among those few. He's sitting in one of the tavern's many cozy nooks, picking away at a plate of mutton curry while sipping from a brass bowl of white chiang, a popular local drink. The explorer, living up to his name, has come a long way to get here. The rest of the village locals in the tavern eye him with a variety of knowing glances. They've seen so many like him before, smug smiles and puffed chests, thinking they'll be able to count themselves among the exalted few who've conquered the mountain to end all mountains. The bodies of many men like this are still frozen to the mountain's surface. One brave local, an older man who can speak English fluently, slides in across the table from the explorer. The old-timer tells him that whatever he thinks he'll find up on the mountain, honor, glory, recognition, he'd be better off searching for it elsewhere. Death awaits on the icy rocks above. The explorer, young, fit, and still feeling mighty smug, replies that death is there for the people who haven't worked hard enough, who haven't prepared. He's scaled other mountains before, all across the globe, from Scotland to Peru. Everest would hold no surprises for him, just a new, compelling challenge. The old man is, as you could probably imagine, unamused by the explorer's hubris. All confidence and bluster now he says with his thin, raspy voice. But what will you say when you are face to face with the king? The explorer, assuming that this king refers to the mountain itself, <laughs> smiles and replies, I'll ask him for his crown. With that, the old man leaves, content that he at least tried to dissuade the explorer from going on this doomed journey. If nothing else, his conscience would be clear now. He had done all that he possibly could. The explorer, not bothered by the grim prophecies of superstitious locals, finishes his curry and chiang and retires to the room he rented upstairs. He's so excited. Tomorrow, it will finally be time. All his months of training will pay off. He will climb to Mount Everest's peak. It would be an achievement to last a whole lifetime, one he would never ever forget, no matter how much he wants to. The next day, the tip of his ice axe cleaves into the mountainside as he grunts, strains, and pulls himself up another few feet. He's about 2,000 meters up, and every additional meter is fighting him. It's the bitterest cold he's ever known, a freeze so deep it makes his incredibly expensive thermal locking clothes feel like he's wearing wet, one-ply toilet paper. But the pain doesn't matter. The cold doesn't matter. He finds it exhilarating. Of course, just as the old man had warned, Death could be waiting for him on this mountain, but the truth is, the explorer has never felt more alive. He winches himself up a few feet more, trying to regulate his breathing as his icy fingers, wrapped in thick gloves, struggle to find purchase on what feels like a sheer cliff face. There are many times when he's supporting his full body weight with only his hands. It often takes the kind of Herculean strength that only a lifetime of training can give you. After all, there's no room for error on Mount Everest. One wrong move, and you're either plummeting to your death or becoming a permanent frozen fixture of the mountainside. And because Everest is so dangerous, nobody comes to collect the bodies of dead mountaineering hopefuls. Their corpses, coated in often colorful winter jackets, litter the mountain. 
Some look at them as a tragic warning. Other, more morbid mountaineers use them as mile markers for their own more successful ascents. Whether the explorer would be lucky or become just another dead, frozen mile marker is still entirely up to chance. He climbs for a few more hours, pushing past his body's complaints, his physical limitations, until he reaches a well-earned plateau. Here, he establishes a small base camp and eats some of his rations. The area is thankfully guarded enough to keep out the worst of the sub-zero winds, so he can at least get some sleep without freezing to death. Mount Everest cannot be conquered today, and even someone with the explorer's bravado wouldn't dare to try. But as he settles down to sleep for the night, he can't help but look up and the enormity of what stands before him, he finds utterly terrifying. The mountain just keeps going and going and going, stretching up into the misty heavens, like the tip would only be a short jump from the moon. For the first time, the explorer begins to genuinely wonder, will I scale this mountain, or will I die on it? What he never even considers is that there may be a third option that's so, so much worse. Over the next few days, he keeps climbing further and further. Hundreds, then thousands of meters pass under him as he breaks past even the boundaries biology seem to set for him. He's impossible to deter, an engine of pure, burning willpower, going because he knows he cannot stop. Because he knows that if he throws in the towel now, it will have all been for nothing. He'll be just another failure, one speck among billions. He'll have no meaning, no legacy. He'll just be another average Joe forgotten. And that honestly scares him even more than the prospect of freezing to death up here. Eventually, even though it costs him almost everything to do it, he reaches 8,000 meters, an area known as the Death Zone, where it's believed to be impossible for humans to acclimate. This is the thin, rarefied air that few have been permitted to breathe, and he's seen so many brightly colored mile markers on the way to here. The ground is slippery, and the air chews into the explorer's skin but he knows he's made it this far. Less than a thousand meters from the peak now, he has almost conquered the mountain. So you can only imagine how surprised he feels when he sees another mountaineer walking down the side of the mountain towards him with an eerie kind of casualness. He's wearing standard mountain climbing gear, including white thermal pants and a hooded coat, zipped up to the chin. The explorer can't make out the stranger's face beyond the pair of thick, black goggles he's wearing over his eyes. What the hell is going on here? The second the stranger's eyes fall upon him, he feels a frightening sensation. The bite of the cold is gone. The chilling winds can't reach him. Instead, he feels warm, cozy, and content, like he's sitting in front of a warm fire in a well-insulated log cabin. In any other circumstance, these sensations might be welcomed, but a seasoned mountaineer knows that this is actually one of the worst things you can feel. It means that death is creeping in, and your body is opening the front door and welcoming it. And if this stranger is causing that feeling, then one thing is certain. He's bad news. The explorer wants to turn and run, but he finds that he can't. It's almost as though he's frozen in place, entranced by the warm, inviting feeling that the other mountaineer seems to exude as he gets closer and closer. That's when the explorer notices something strange about him. Something is glowing through his goggles, like hot embers, burning a bright, luminous orange. Are those eyes? Dear God, are those his eyes? The explorer can feel their terrible stare, literally feel it. It hurts to be looked at by this monster. Yes, that's what it is. A monster. A monster in the shape of a man. Why are you here, mortal? Comes a booming voice from the inhuman mountaineer. Do you wish to challenge me? The explorer can't form words. He's quaking, his body acknowledging the cold that his mind can't as those two glowing eyes bore into him. Speak, the stranger commands. Who? What? Are you? The explorer forces out between chattering teeth. The stranger laughs. I am the king of the mountain. Though to the SCP Foundation, he's better known as SCP-1529, and he's the worst possible thing you can run into while trying to scale Mount Everest. The explorer remembers his conversation with the old man in the tavern, the question he asked, what will you say when you're face to face with the king? And his own foolish answer, I'll ask him for his crown. Now, really, truly face to face with the king of the mountain, all the poor terrified explorer can do is whimper and beg for mercy. 
Please, he says, the tears freezing on his cheeks as they fall. I just wanted to climb. The king of the mountain gives another booming laugh, his eyes burning. Then you will climb, he says, and climb and climb and climb. The king of the mountain must have wielded truly unspeakable power to do what he does next. With a simple nod, the explorer is suddenly hanging off of the mountainside, his fingers digging into the craggy rocks. The only thing supporting his weight. It was like being back at square one all over again, except with added pain, terror, and cold so deep he can feel his bones rattling. And all the while, he feels those eyes upon him, those burning, fiery eyes, staring with absolute malice. He keeps climbing. Every time he reaches a plateau, a place where he might camp and find even momentary comfort, the king of the mountain is already waiting there, staring that horrible stare. And just like that, the explorer was climbing again, wind whipping against him like forty lashes from a cat of nine tails. That, coupled with the endless strain of the climb on his muscles, is the worst agony he's ever felt. And yet, he never dies. Even though he hasn't eaten in days, weeks, months, years, he never, ever dies. He just fulfills the same torturous loop over and over again. It's like the king of the mountain is just keeping him alive for his own amusement, a toy that's impossible to break. But while the explorer never breaks, as time goes on and the torments never cease, he does begin to change, like rock being molded by the tide. First, from the endless stress, his hair falls out, his skin goes pale from the lack of sun, his body becomes thin and wiry from starvation and malnourishment. The endless physical strain even warps his limbs. His arms and legs begin to stretch, his body becoming elongated and grotesque. All the way through this horrific, dehumanizing ordeal, the king of the mountain stares at him. One day, the explorer, now changed, reaches a plateau. And as can be expected, the king of the mountain stares at him with his burning eyes. The explorer cowers and covers his face with his hands, sobbing from exhaustion. He just wants the king of the mountain to look away, to leave him be. He babbles incoherently. He doesn't want to be seen anymore. His pain simply makes the king of the mountain laugh. I gave you your wish, the mountain king says, his voice oozing with contempt. You climbed, didn't you? You thought that your climbing would elevate you, make you more than human. But now, you're so much less. Our business concludes here. I'm tired of playing with you. And with that, the king is gone. The explorer is alone, stranded among the snow and the whipping winds of the death zone, but very much alive. He's finally able to go. At long last, after what felt like an eternity, he's escaped. When the explorer arrives in the village again, He's not the explorer at all. It's been years since he went missing on the mountain. The old man who had warned him not to go up onto Mount Everest had passed peacefully in the interim. The other members of his small village would not be afforded the same luxury. Instead, the explorer stumbled back through the village limits, still covering his face. The only sounds he can hear are the wailing wind and his own pitiful sobbing. Everything hurts. He's so terribly afraid. He needs somebody to help him. Why will nobody help him? The sun begins to rise, and the village shakes itself awake. People leave their homes to go about their daily tasks. None of them are expecting to see a monster loping through their streets, a pale, gangling monstrosity, stretched and hairless. It engenders a mix of fear and curiosity as it stumbles around, audibly sobbing with a loud, warped voice. It's like nothing any of them have ever seen before, like something out of a myth or a folktale. But for the monster that was once the explorer, it's so much worse. At first, he thinks that the villagers might be there to help him, but then he sees their eyes, that same intense, burning fire pit orange as the king of the mountain, that same horrible gaze that the explorer thought he'd escaped when he left the mountain, the gaze that meant pain, torment, and madness. Even when he tries to cover his face, when he wails at them to go away in words that make sense to no one but him, he can still feel those terrible eyes on him. Is he still on the mountain? Is he still at the mercy of the Mountain King? Are these all just illusions or projections, another awful trick? What did he ever do to deserve this kind of torment? Was the crime of wanting to climb a damn mountain worth this kind of everlasting suffering? Did it earn him the gaze of all these monstrous eyes? 
the explorer begins to feel his anguish being replaced by another feeling, rapidly rising rage, the kind of pure blistering hatred that inexorably leads to one result, violence. First, he screams, then they scream, and finally, the killing begins. The creature that had once been the explorer leaves no stone unturned. Even when they try to run away, he still feels their eyes on him. He needs to kill them all, to annihilate them quickly, leave no trace. It's the only way he can feel anything close to at peace again. It becomes a kind of terrible chain reaction. The sound of the horrors going on in the street only entices more to come outside and see what's going on, to look at the creature causing all this carnage, to see its face. They have no idea that this very action is dooming them. And within the hour, the village is empty, save for one creature, the creature that had once been the explorer, now just afraid, confused, and alone. He will always be alone. The anomaly that will soon be known as SCP-096 simply bows its head and weeps. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, he's scared of it. But the creature doesn't move, and neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding, trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that, that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes? He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick. But then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing, and no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it, but he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees. Just like before, the sounds of the city melt away, the only sound coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner, and nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno! Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as The Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT 
is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed, because if you see 015IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow, needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear. And it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015-IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. DIA-212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the boogeyman is also quite intelligent, as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Alardi was making good progress with the creature, 
and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015-IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal, domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. A climber struggles on the side of the mountain. He's so close to the summit of Mount Everest that he can taste it. He just needs to triumph over this last difficult section and he will have fulfilled his lifetime dream of standing at the top of the world. He needs to hurry though. At this altitude, the air is so thin and the temperature is so cold that your body is slowly dying. There's a reason this topmost section of the mountain is known as the death zone. He glances down behind him and spots something. Is that another climber? That's strange, he thinks. He was at the very back of his group and there shouldn't have been anyone else coming up behind him. It must be a solo climber. The soloist doesn't look to be moving, though. He's just staring at him, and the climber can't seem to take his eyes off him. Suddenly, the climber starts feeling odd. He begins to feel warm and comfortable. The aches and pains of the long journey melt away. He decides to sit down on a small ledge and relax. He watches as the solo climber comes towards him. He must be a professional with the way he effortlessly moves up the mountain. He watches him make great time, getting closer and closer. He loses sight as the solo climber reaches the same difficult section he had been struggling with. He imagines the solo climber will soon zip past him on his way to the summit. But just then, the soloist pops up right in front of him. He clasps his hands on the climber's shoulders and pulls him close, staring into his eyes with those dark black goggles. They feel like they're pulling him into their depths, and there's nothing he can do to resist it. The climber tries to scream, but all that comes out of his mouth is silence. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1529, also known as King of the Mountain. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-1529 is an entity with a humanoid appearance that resides near the summit of Mount Everest in Nepal. It is only found above 8,000 meters, which places it in the part of the mountain referred to as the Death Zone, where oxygen levels are too low to support human life for any extended period of time. It is roughly equivalent to an average human male in height and weight, and its outer appearance resembles normal mountaineering clothes, with a heavy parka, pants, and boots that are all white in color. Its face is completely obscured by a large hood, with the only visible detail being a pair of large, dark goggles. SCP-1529 has never been seen wearing any other outfit, and in fact, it is unknown whether these are articles of clothing at all, or if they are actually a part of its body. The SCP Foundation first became aware of an anomalous entity lurking near the top of Mount Everest in the 1970s, when climbing expeditions to the summit became more commonplace among professional and amateur mountaineers alike. Rumors began to spread and told of a monster that was killing unfortunate climbers. In 1999, 
The body of George Mallory, who is believed to be the first person to reach the top of Mount Everest, was located, and photographic film found on his body was developed. From those pictures, it is now known that SCP-1529 was present at least as early as his 1924 expedition. When sufficient daylight and a lack of cloud cover allows observation of the peak by telescope, SCP-1529 can be seen sitting or lying on the mountain, apparently motionless in an inactive state. These motionless periods have been seen to last anywhere from 17 minutes to as long as 8 months. When active though, it can be seen summiting and descending the upper portion of the mountain, though it never uses any climbing tools and will ignore established climbing ropes and ladders that have been installed by other climbers. It has also been observed easily traversing portions of the mountain that are considered too difficult or altogether impossible by experienced climbers. Additionally, SCP-1529 is not impacted by the freezing temperatures, extreme wind speeds, or low oxygen levels at the top of the mountain, and it has never once been seen to stumble, fall, or even lose its grip. It is unknown what prompts SCP-1529 to become active or enter a resting inactive phase, nor has there been any established correlation of these phases to weather, time of year, or traffic on the mountain. Its active periods have been observed to last between mere hours to several days, but the exact amount is hard to know for sure. Nighttime observation of 1529 has so far been impossible even with thermal imaging cameras since it produces no heat, with its temperatures being the same as that of the surrounding environment. When in its active phase, if a human climber passes the 8,000 meter mark, then SCP-1529 will begin to make its way towards them, putting itself in the path between the climber and either the summit if they are ascending or their camp if they are descending. It seems to prefer to go after solo climbers or those that are significantly ahead or behind their climbing group, but it has been observed targeting climbers in a group when a solo opportunity is not available. Once SCP-1529 is within eyesight of its targeted climber, it will attempt to gain their attention and then lock eyes with them, which produces a hypnotic effect. The climber will find that they are unable to break eye contact with SCP-1529 and will then begin to experience feelings of warmth and euphoria, similar to the effects of hypothermia and hypoxia, also known as altitude sickness. The victim will feel the overwhelming desire to sit down where they are, and once they stop moving, SCP-1529 will quickly close the distance between them. Once SCP-1529 reaches the victim, death is almost a certainty. An examination of bodies has shown the cause to be from hypothermia. Strangely, it's been observed that victims seem to succumb within just one to two hours after having first made eye contact with SCP-1529, a period of time much shorter than usual for climbers trapped on the summit of Everest. After death, the victims' bodies experience an accelerated rate of decay, and after mere hours or days, the bodies become rotted and mummified at a level comparable to bodies that have been exposed to the wind and cold of the mountain for decades. Many of the over 200 deaths on Mount Everest have been attributed to SCP-1529, and the rare survivor of an encounter is almost always due to the intervention of another mountaineer, who was able to offer assistance to the entranced climber before SCP-1529 was able to reach them. There have been several notable reports from survivors of interactions with SCP-1529. One, known as Incident 1529-1, is also the only documented instance of SCP-1529 descending below the 8,000 meter mark. During the incident, the entity entered Camp 5, located on the northern approach of the mountain at 7,775 meters, which resulted in multiple deaths, including two Foundation personnel who were operating the monitoring posts. One climber, who had initially believed to have been killed in the incident, was discovered to still be alive two days later when Foundation personnel were conducting investigations at the camp. He was safely removed from the mountain, though he required the amputation of several frostbitten fingers and toes. During an interview with a Foundation agent, they described spotting SCP-1529 just 10 minutes after leaving the summit of the mountain. After locking eyes with the entity, they began to feel happy, comfortable, and relieved, like they were back at home next to a warm fire. But then suddenly the warmth was gone, and they experienced a sensation of cold more powerful than anything they had felt before. They were stuck, and could only watch as 1529 made its way towards them. When it finally reached them, it placed its hands on their shoulders and pulled them up into its face so that they were staring right into its black goggles. Images began to appear in the dark depths of the goggles. People warm and happy, sitting next to fires, in hot baths, or sunning on a beach. 
They tried to resist the strange pull of the creature with all of their might. They then heard something in their mind, a question from SCP-1529. It asked, you would refuse my gift. The stranded climber struggled to answer, using all of their willpower and strength to move their lips and whisper a single word, yes. SCP-1529 responded by showing more images of people, but this time they were bodies lying dead in the snow, countless victims trapped on Mount Everest forever. SCP-1529 made them watch their deaths play out in long, drawn-out detail, a witness to every second of their demise. The climber was sure they would soon join them, but then they found something deep inside of them, a spark of life, a will to resist. They clenched their fist, and with their final ounce of strength, they punched SCP-1529. The goggles appeared to crack, and the next thing the climber knew, they were woken up by the Foundation Recovery Team. Following this encounter, the climber never attempted to summit another mountain. When they eventually passed away some years later, an autopsy revealed that their cause of death was consistent with extreme hypothermia, frostbite, and cerebral edema, despite not having been in a cold environment or above 500 meters in altitude in the previous 12 months. SCP-1529 has been classified as Euclid and is to be kept under telescope and satellite surveillance whenever possible. Though telescope observation should make use of a delayed video feed, as observers have reported seeing SCP-1529 appearing to stare back at them, and reported feeling symptoms consistent with an encounter, including hypothermia and frostbite. The Foundation maintains communication with civilian mountaineering expeditions to prevent summiting attempts when SCP-1529 is active. The bodies of any victims are to be removed from the mountain, if possible, for autopsy, with their deaths being officially classified as having been from natural causes related to altitude sickness and hypothermia. Any survivors of encounters with SCP-1529 are to be debriefed and administered amnestics. Mobile Task Force Psi-29029, also known as Alpine Echo, is to remain on standby at all times at a permanent monitoring station with on-duty members remaining in a pressurized environment acclimatized to 7,900 meters above sea level, allowing them to quickly deploy via helicopter if need be. Finally, and most troubling, is that aerial surveillance of another mountain has revealed an individual similar in appearance to SCP-1529. The location remains classified, and the local government has prohibited climbing on the peak, so threats to humanity are minimal at this time. But the Foundation will continue to monitor it and other mountains for anomalous activity. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth, and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. But as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. 
Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow, towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular, but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the 1st of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and, in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. 
The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort, 
The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting King of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the King of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment 
will receive level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. It is November of 1966 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It's a crisp, clear night, the kind of natural beauty only autumn in Appalachia can bring. The lush green mountainsides have gone fiery as the season changed from summer to fall, vivid oranges, reds, and yellows flooding the landscape and turning the hills into a sunset. Now, in the dim light of the moon, the colors are muted but still glorious, dancing in a silvery blue glow. The spooky fun of Halloween has come and gone, leaving the warm, cozy feelings of the harvest, of fresh-pressed apple cider, corn mazes filled with happy families, cuddling up around the fire with a flannel blanket and a mug of something hot and sweet. Some people think Christmas is the most romantic time of the year, or Valentine's Day, or spring, when the wildflowers bloom and the breeze carries their perfume through the town. But to at least one happy couple, this is the most romantic thing they could possibly imagine. Their young man and a young woman, driving down the winding country road. They're so in love, and they feel like the only two people in the entire world. At this moment, life is good. They're driving just to drive, to crank up the radio and enjoy being alone together. But after a long stretch of road with nothing much in sight, they decide to drive a little bit further away from town, over toward an area nicknamed the TNT area for its former life as a World War II munitions plant site. Now, of course, it's just mostly wildlife out there, but it'll look beautiful at night, and it should be completely private. As the car winds around a curve in the road, the woman thinks she sees something out of the corner of her eye, and her heart skips a beat, taking her back to long-forgotten childhood fears. As a little kid, she always used to get nervous driving at night, imagining a monster running alongside the car as it went, trying to catch her. She used to picture long, pale limbs and big eyes, something loping along on all fours, dipping in and out of sight between the moonlight and the shadows. She would have nightmares about what the creature might do if it ever caught up to the car, if it ever reached through the window and pulled her out into the darkness. But of course, that was just a flight of fancy, the sort of thing a bored child's mind cooks up on a long drive. Imagining monsters where there are just dead tree branches or nocturnal animals. But now, seeing motion in the forest out the window, she feels that same breathless terror she felt as a little girl. She doesn't even realize she's squeezing her boyfriend's hand too tight until he pulls it away with a wince. Easy, before you crush me. He laughs, but there's worry in his eyes. You okay? She nods, shaking off the feeling. Sure, I'm fine. She privately chides herself for being so silly, for letting her own imagination get the better of her. She's lived in Point Pleasant all her life. She's no stranger to wildlife. Animals come out at night sometimes. It's just as much their world to live in as it is hers, she reminds herself. She's just starting to settle in, to let herself relax, when she sees it again. A fluttering motion, like great big dark wings, flapping at the edge of the area illuminated by the headlights. Something about it, the way it moves, the way it shimmers in the light that seems to shine right through it like black mist, it feels deeply wrong. Like the old stories her grandfather used to tell her about the things you see in the mountains late at night, things you never want to come close to. He'd once told her about a mountain lion with the face of a woman, or a deer he watched stand up on its hind legs. She'd never seen anything quite like that, but the feeling he described, the deep sense of the unnatural, the way her mind and body recoil instinctively from this sight, feels the same. Did you see that? She asks, her throat so tight that her voice comes out in a whisper. Her boyfriend shakes his head. See what? There deer out there? You know, a deer completely wrecked my last car, ran right into me. He was fine, got up and walked off like nothing happened. Me, on the other hand. No, it wasn't a deer. She shakes her head. Never mind, it's silly. But the little break in her voice makes him pause. He turns the wheel, pulling the car over by the side of the road, and parks there. Hey, look at me. What's got you so shaken up? He puts a hand on her shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. 
I just, I thought I saw something. She sighs, feeling absurd as she says it out loud. Well, you probably did. All kinds of animals out here. But it's fine, they're more scared of us than we are of them, he reassures her. She shakes her head, frowning. No, I know that. It wasn't an animal, I think. I couldn't quite see it, but I got this awful feeling. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Whatever I got a glimpse of, I can't explain it. I just feel like there was something wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be here. She rests her face in her hands, struggling to find the words. He rubs her back, unsure what else to do, what else to say. They sit like that for a long while, before she finally sits back up. Want to go home? He asks. She nods weakly. I'm sorry. I know you wanted to go driving more. It's a new car. He cuts her off. I want to do what you want to do. Come on, let's go by the diner and get a couple burgers. See if they've got any cherry pie left. Sound good? She nods. Sounds great. The young man is just about to put the car back in drive when there is a sudden fluttering motion, something moving through the headlights beam. This time, they both see it, and they can only watch wide-eyed as it settles to a stop directly in front of their car. There, the size of a grown man with a 10-foot wingspan is something unlike anything they have ever seen before. It's massive, dark gray, its face shielded from view by the limited light, with one notable exception. Boring into them are a pair of glowing red eyes, wide and piercing. Then, with a flap of its wings, as quickly as it appeared, the strange thing is gone again. The couple sit in complete silence for a long time before they turn to look at each other. They don't speak, but their expressions both say the same thing. You saw that too, right? Still too shocked to speak, the young man cranks the engine with trembling hands, and the two speed off back down the deserted road toward town. They have to get back. They have to call the police and tell them… what? That they saw a monster? A flying man with glowing eyes? Will anyone even believe them? Suddenly, the young woman's voice breaks through the tense quiet in the car. Behind us! She cries out. The man glances in the rearview mirror and sees what he would assume were red headlights if he didn't already recognize them. Sure enough, the massive thing is flying behind their car, following them along the road. The car takes a turn, and so does the creature. The car speeds up, and it flaps its wings to catch up to them. It doesn't do anything else, doesn't try to grab them or break the back windshield, it just follows them, watching with an expression that he could almost call curiosity. Then, after five tense miles, it just disappears again, and they're alone. Truly alone. That chill on the back of their necks is gone and they know that wherever that creature came from, it's gone back there, at least for now. When they make it back to town, they pull into the police station and rush inside. They can hardly get their words out as they try to tell the officer on duty what exactly they saw. He's skeptical, of course. Two scared kids seeing things that aren't there, he assumes. But they insist again and again that they know what they saw. He humors them, listens to their story, and suggests that it was some sort of large wild bird. Animals' eyes reflect light, he reminds them and everything looks worse at night, especially when someone is already all worked up. Realizing they won't be believed, the couple head home and get ready for bed. But they don't sleep. They can't. All they can think about is that massive figure landing right in front of their car and staring directly at them. Its unbelievable wingspan, its speed, the strange interest it had shown in following them home until it disappeared without a trace. What did it want? Will it ever come back? As they lie in bed, staring up at the ceiling and replaying the events of the night again and again in their minds, they wonder if they'll ever get the answers to those questions. One thing is for certain, though. They'll never forget those eyes as long as they live. Contrary to what the police officer thought about their story, this pair of young lovers were not the only ones to see the strange, winged creature around Point Pleasant. Over the next month, Others reported seeing similar things, and soon, eyewitness accounts were pouring in on a regular basis. A pair of volunteer firemen saw it while on duty, describing a massive bird with bright red eyes. A police officer reported seeing an unusually large bird-like animal with eyes that reflected the glow from his flashlight. A group of gravediggers doing their work looked up from their shovels to see something large, dark, and winged fly through the sky overhead, temporarily blotting out the moon. It soared overhead and landed in a far-off tree. All over town, people reported sightings of the creature, and the story grew and grew. The sheriff tried to calm the townspeople down, positing that it was just a sandhill crane, a large bird with a seven-foot wingspan and reddish coloring around its eyes. But the reports kept coming in, and they only got more bizarre. 
Some said it could fly over 100 miles per hour. Others said it could appear and disappear at will. A man in Salem, West Virginia blamed the creature for strange patterns appearing on the screen of his television set and for strange noises he heard outside of his home at night. Then came the strange being's most infamous appearance. Eyewitnesses saw it, a massive, shadowy winged figure, on the night of December 15th, flying over the Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River. Soon after this sighting, the bridge collapsed and 46 people lost their lives. Though a fracture in the suspension chain was the culprit, people whispered around town that this mysterious creature was somehow responsible. If not responsible, then the monster was at least connected. It had to be. How could it be a coincidence? This mysterious apparition grew to be known as the Mothman, or simply Mothman. But to the SCP Foundation, it had a different name, SCP-2901. And according to their findings, there wasn't just one Mothman, but an entire species. SCP-2901 refers to a species of carnivorous scavenger creatures that, thus far, have demonstrated limited intelligence. They stand at an average height of 1.7 meters and generally appear to have an ellipsoidal shape with two large red eyes covered in photophoric tissue. Their bodies are covered in tiny iridescent scales similar to those found in moths, butterflies, and other insects belonging to the Lepidoptera order. They are not bound by standard rules of space or time and are able to move through both at will. This gives them seemingly impossible abilities such as levitation, flight, teleportation, and the emission of an acoustic cancellation effect thought to help them avoid detection. In spite of these talents, they are still impervious to some ordinary forces, such as standard firearms. Due to their unique abilities making them especially elusive, these creatures have proven difficult to contain using conventional methods. Not only that, but it has become increasingly difficult over time to keep the general public from discussing the possibility of their existence. The first appearance of SCP-2901 on record occurred in West Virginia in 1967, shortly before the catastrophic collapse of the Silver Bridge. Since then, SCP-2901 instances have gone out of their way to avoid humans, keeping to themselves as much as possible and vanishing from sight when approached. However, they have continued to manifest near the sites of various disasters, appearing to a handful of eyewitnesses in the location approximately a week to a month before something terrible occurs there. Somehow, through a predictive ability compared by some researchers to a sense of smell, they are able to detect when an event resulting in multiple fatalities will occur. Once they have first appeared in an area, the creatures will remain there and guard it until the disaster comes to pass. They are extremely territorial, fighting with each other for dominance over the area, and even changing their shapes to frighten humans that wander into their territory. Once the disaster has occurred, the instances of SCP-2901 in the area will scavenge the dead until there is no more food left for them. Then, they will disappear once and for all, leaving no trace behind. Because SCP-2901 cannot be physically contained, the SCP Foundation has instead put guidelines in place for managing the creature's appearances, as well as what to do if an agent encounters one of these ethereal beings in the field. Cases involving SCP-2901 are assigned to Mobile Task Force 55, also known as the Twilighters. Not to be confused with fans of a certain young adult vampire romance series. Any civilian encounters with SCP-2901 should be addressed with standard amnestic procedures, and any media leaks regarding the creatures such as social media posts, YouTube videos, or local news reports will be deleted or otherwise countered by the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division. Field agents have been instructed to avoid SCP-2901 if possible, and carry mobile devices capable of SMS messaging in the event of one of the creatures using acoustic cancellation. If an operative comes face to face with an instance of SCP-2901 and there is no way to avoid a direct confrontation, there are specific steps that they must follow in order to minimize casualties. First, do not attempt to run away from the creature, lest it be provoked to chase after you. Second, hold your ground and maintain eye contact. Do not show weakness. Third, make a threat display, similar to the display the creatures use to frighten civilians away. Use your clothing to make yourself look bigger, stand on your tiptoes, and spread your arms wide. Continue this step until SCP-2901 either loses interest or is intimidated into standing down. If the creature approaches, do whatever you can to keep from touching it. Throw objects or brandish a makeshift weapon if you must. Though they do not tend to deliberately harm living humans, the fluctuating nature of the creature's position in space and time causes direct physical contact between them and a human to result in a dermal fusion. Essentially, they become stuck together. But the creature does not realize this. 
When they then attempt to flee and leave the human behind, the results are… painful, to say the least. Imagine the feeling of ripping off a large band-aid. Now multiply that by a thousand, and multiply again. One more time? That's what it feels like. Though these guidelines were put together with Foundation field operatives in mind, they may come in handy for any civilian who accidentally crosses paths with SCP-2901. Should you find yourself in that unfortunate position, I hope that this information will help you avoid unnecessary trauma and pain. One more thing. I initially believed the preceding information to be all the available research into the nature of SCP-2901. However, after obtaining some additional security clearance through methods I won't detail here out of concern for the safety of all involved, I was able to locate this classified entry into its official file. It is a missive from the Information, Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division, and details a practice of containment known as Operation Surgeon's Photograph, intended to act as a public disinformation campaign regarding the nature of SCP-2901. The purpose of this operation is not to conceal information about SCP-2901 from the public, but rather to control the information they have access to. A summary of the operation's methodology and ongoing success was included, and reads as follows. SCP-2901's current evolution is the sum of Foundation efforts in manipulating its existence through public perception. SCP-2901 are a group of extra-dimensional entities that lack a stable cohesive form and purpose that only coalesces through continued observational reconciliation. For SCP-2901 to maintain a stable physical mass, approximately 75% of the nearby human populace within 500 kilometers need to be congruent on a singular concept of what SCP-2901 is and what it does. SCP-2901 were first discovered and categorized as highly unstable Keter-class entities, capable of producing localized CK-class scenarios at random. Further research into SCP-2901's unstable manifestations proved to be futile, as, unbeknownst to Foundation scientists at the time, SCP-2901 would involuntarily change during each subsequent observation. During a containment breach into the civilian populated areas within the Appalachian region of the southern United States, SCP-2901 began gradually condensing into a singular manifestation the more it was exposed to humans. Civilians began conceding to the idea that SCP-2901 was a dark, winged-like humanoid with large red eyes, which corresponded to pre-existing local folklore. SCP-2901 also began to evolve predatory-like behaviors and anomalous acoustic effects that conceptualized due to the mass fear generated within the surrounding communities. Foundation researchers recognized the effects and began isolating SCP-2901 as much as possible. However, deprived of regular perceptual input, SCP-2901 began to devolve into its initial highly unstable manifestations once again. The decision was made to maintain SCP-2901 in a functioning, manageable state through continued exposure to human perceptual belief that SCP-2901 is a tangible creature of local folklore, another Bigfoot or Loch Ness monster. The nearby Silver Bridge collapse of 1967 and the SCP-2901 Appalachian incursion, in reality, have no connection with one another. However, public opinion strongly disagreed, and henceforth SCP-2901 began to appear at other future disaster events. This was the precursor of the precognitive scavenging animal-like behavior that is observed today. Efforts are to continue gradually introducing notions developed by the Foundation as to further SCP-2901's evolution into a more docile and manageable concept. I'm not sure I appreciate the implication that Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster don't exist. I, for one, am still holding out hope. But this finding still does compel me. Belief is a powerful thing. It can shape the world around us in unexpected ways, and apparently can even shift the nature of an entire race of creatures that otherwise refuse to abide by our rules and our understanding. Who knows what these beings will look like, how they will behave a few years down the line. For now, they are shadowy, precognitive scavengers, waiting in the wings for humanity to encounter disaster, then picking up the leftovers for themselves. They may not mean us any harm, but the sight of them can and should still strike terror into the heart. If you're ever out on your own and you spot a wide pair of glowing red eyes in the darkness, hear the rustle of leaves, of something floating through the trees like a cloud of black mist, you should probably leave that place immediately. You won't want to be there for what's coming next. Because whether it takes a day or a month, SCP-2901 only goes where it knows it will be fed. An elderly woman wakes in the middle of the night to the sounds of chaos just outside. She stumbles out of her bed in her nightgown, carrying a lantern, and rushes to check on the cows in her field. 
From a distance in the dark, she can see one of the cows lying on its side, dead. Standing over it is a fox, but something is wrong with it. The animal is standing on two legs, using its paw-like hands to tear at the cow's corpse. She drops her lantern and screams. It is the late 1940s, and the world is still reeling from the destruction and devastation of the Second World War. While nations are trying desperately to rebuild and citizens are mourning the fallen, the SCP Foundation has no time to grieve. Anomalous threats don't come to a stop just because the rest of the world is trying to put its collective pieces back together. For the members of the 5th Squad of the Eastern Division of the SCP Foundation, a global tragedy must take a back seat to smaller, localized, and potentially anomalous tragedy in the form of several unusual deaths in Busan, Korea. Three agents are dispatched to the area and told to investigate while posing as reporters covering the story. When they first arrive, they hear about a troubling eyewitness account that has steered local authorities in the direction of animal attacks. An elderly woman saw something eating one of her cows, a mix between a fox and a human. Naturally, the authorities have written her off, but something in her story rings true to one of the agents. He can remember tales his grandmother once told him, sadistic old bat that she was, stories of fox people with razor-sharp claws and fangs glistening with fresh blood. The other two agents have similar cultural stories to share, folk tales about women who were foxes in disguise, living amongst hapless humans. Some of the stories were romantic, about fox wives marrying human husbands, having children and families. Others were horrible, too horrible to repeat. The three agents can only hope they haven't stumbled into the latter type of story. But when has a mission from the SCP Foundation ever led to a fairy tale outcome? The three men begin to comb the area, searching for any evidence of this creature, a fox person with a taste for hunting cows, and perhaps humans as well. Before very long at all, they stumble upon a beautiful young woman sitting serenely under a waterfall. Clad in nothing more than a light robe, she tries to nervously hide her bare feet at the sight of the strange men, but she doesn't do a very good job. The three agents can plainly see, in place of the feet of a human woman, she has paws covered in reddish-brown fur, the feet of a fox. This must be a young, inexperienced creature of her kind, they realize. Otherwise, how could they have tracked her down so easily? If the men were smarter, less blinded by lust, laziness, and an eagerness for simple answers, they might have asked more questions. Questions like, why did we find her so quickly? Why isn't she hiding? How did she get close enough to kill those people when she's so bad at concealing herself? But they don't stop and think, don't stop to ask those questions, and that oversight will be what seals their fate. After realizing that the agents intend her no apparent harm, the fox woman smiles warmly at them. She invites the men to come back to her cottage with her for a hot meal and the chance to meet more of her kind. At first, Agent 3 is unsure about the offer, but the other two accept eagerly, swayed by the majority vote and reminding himself that they are three armed men against one slender, if anomalous, woman. He relents and accepts the invitation as well. They follow the lovely woman, like flies buzzing eagerly into a spider's web, without the slightest inkling of what's to come. When they reach the cottage, they find it modest but homey, rustic but warm. It has a certain undeniable charm, the same charm shared by the woman who led them there. She sits them at the dining table, the picture of delighted hospitality. She insists on serving them, and they are all too happy to let her. She pours them cups of plum wine and dishes out bowls of rice, pickled turnips, and perfectly seasoned meat. After dinner, with full bellies and sleepy, wine-fogged minds, the agents decide to stay the night in her guest beds. After all, why shouldn't they? The creature seems to mean them no harm, and she has no reason to feel threatened or try to attack them in any way. They'll see about containment options in the morning, after a good night's rest. Sometime in the night, Agent 3 wakes to find Agent 1 is gone. Strangely, he must have gotten up to use the bathroom in the night, or rather to make use of a bush outside, since there is no formal bathroom in the cottage. The thought reminds Agent 3 of his own full bladder, and he tiptoes out into the night to relieve himself. As he stumbles through the darkness, he suddenly hears muffled groaning, the wet slap of flesh against flesh. All at once, it hits him. Agent 1 must be out here, and from the sound of it, he isn't alone. Surely he wouldn't, but up ahead, he can make out the silhouettes of Agent 1 and the Fox Woman together. 
That's a Foundation ethics violation of some kind, it has to be. Agent 3 opens his mouth to say something when Agent 1 suddenly collapses to the ground in front of the Fox Woman. As his eyes adjust to the dark, Agent 3 can see that his fallen friend's shirt is stained with blood and his throat has been ripped out. In her clawed hand, the Fox Woman holds Agent 1's liver, steaming with body heat in the cool night air. She lifts the organ up, examining it with a hungry glint in her eye. Then she opens her mouth, sticks out her tongue, and swallows the liver in a single gulp. The sight reminds Agent 3 of a snake devouring a mouse, and his stomach turns as disgust, horror, and grief overwhelm his system all at once. He watched as the Fox Woman lowered one extra sharp fingernail, using it like a scalpel, and began to cut at the fallen man's skin. All at once, his legs are able to move again. He sprints back toward the cottage, shaking Agent 2 awake. Agent 3 can't quite get his words together, his thoughts scrambled from the horror he just witnessed, but he manages to get one coherent sentence out. We need to leave. Now. Before Agent 2 can ask what the hell is going on, Agent 1 walks into the room as if nothing ever happened. Much to Agent 3's shock, the man doesn't have a gaping hole where his liver should be. That's impossible. But wait, his eyes, they're glowing yellow. That's not an SCP Foundation agent. Something is terribly wrong. Agent 3 doesn't have time to explain to the other agent what's happening. He doesn't have time to think. All he has time to do is draw his weapon and fire at the imposter. As anyone might do in this maddening situation, Agent 2 draws his weapon, pointing it at 3 and ordering him to put the weapon away. 3 tries to explain to convince him that the man he just shot is not their friend, but the fox in disguise. He won't listen, promising to put Agent 3 down like a mad dog for killing their comrade. That's when the fox sees her opening. She grabs hold of Agent 2 from behind, knocking the gun out of his hand, causing it to discharge. Agent 3 cries out in pain as the bullet pierces his flesh, only his upper shoulder, thankfully. Not a fatal wound, but it still hurts like absolute hell. He collapses to the ground from the pain, screaming, while the fox laughs at his misery. It's a truly demonic sound, a loud, high cackle like nothing he's ever heard before. The sound is too much, he has to get away from it, away from her, put something between him and this monster. He drags himself into the living room, pulling the rice paper screen door shut. It won't protect him, but at least he doesn't have to look at her. Unfortunately, another horror awaits him there. On the dining table, laid out like a roast pig ready for carving, is another agent, a man he and the others saw at the base of the mountain a day before. But now, his eyes are wide and glassy, his skin pale and lifeless. He spots the empty bowls, and all at once, the sickening truth washes over him. Their dinner. That meat wasn't pork or beef. It was human. And they didn't eat it with rice, but with maggots, crawling over the meat, slippery and white. His stomach can't help but empty itself, and as he heaves onto the floor, he sees a few maggots still alive in the vomit. No time to think about it anymore. No time to sit with the horrors and let them paralyze him. He needs a weapon, and fast. He manages to snap off a piece of a wooden beam, breaking it into a jagged edge. He angles it just right, just in time for the fox woman to tear through the rice paper door. He jams the jagged edge of the wooden beam into her stomach and makes a run for it. He tears out of the cottage and into the forest, tripping over the rugged landscape and fighting through the agony of his gunshot wound. Suddenly, the sound of running water, a welcome oasis in the dark and the terror. He stumbles onto the riverbank, attempting to wade through the water and cross. But he has too many forces working against him. The pitch black night, the fear, the pain, the confusion from the blood loss. He slips on the wet rocks, hits his head, and is swept away by the rapids. He floats down the river for at least half a mile before he grabs hold of a branch strong enough to pull himself back out of the water. As he drags himself onto dry land, heaving and gasping, he realizes something. He recognizes where he is. The van is just a few feet away. He has a sudden revelation. Fire. In the stories he heard growing up, fire was always the key to defeating an evil force. He doesn't have the keys, but that doesn't matter. He busts through the window and opens up the back. There it is, a Foundation-issued defoliant projector, better known as a good old-fashioned flamethrower. This should do it, if that evil woman manages to track him down again. 
As if summoned by his thoughts, there she is, emerging out of the tree line. She smiles at him, eyes gleaming with menace. He raises the flamethrower and prepares to rain down hell on the monster that killed his friends and fed him their flesh. Several days later, a Foundation retrieval team manages to track down Agent 3. They find him with the Foxwoman, whom they manage to capture and bring into custody. He is a shadow of himself, pale, sweaty, body fighting off a severe infection. He's quickly taken to a hospital to recuperate. Meanwhile, the Foundation is able to study the Foxwoman, who is designated SCP-953, the polymorphic humanoid. About SCP-953, a few things are certain. She is a female red fox, approximately 8 kilograms in weight, with a spine that splits around her 26th vertebra into 9 separate tails. She has polymorphic properties and is able to take on various other forms. Most commonly, she takes on the shape of a beautiful Korean woman. Whenever in a human form, however, she does still maintain at least one fox-like characteristic such as ears, paws, tail, eyes, or mannerisms. If she is able, she will attempt to conceal these elements through various methods of disguise, such as clothing, hats, and hairstyles. In addition to her polymorphic abilities, SCP-953 is observed to possess other supernatural abilities. She has the power of suggestion and telepathy. She can convince others of falsehoods, concealing her nature and the nature of things around her. While the Foundation is discovering this, Agent 3 is busy recovering from his injuries. When he is discharged from the hospital, he sits down for an interview with the Foundation Assistant Director. He lays out the Foundation's plans to terminate the Foxwoman, given her malicious nature and unknown levels of power. Agent 3 vehemently opposes this choice, begging them not to do so. He advises them to contain her, but to be cautious about how they do so. Ordinary methods, he advises, will not be effective. He pleads with the Foundation to consider the creature's nature, saying, She's spiteful. Every little slight in her eyes, she saves up. And the only way she knows how to repay an insult is death. Chaining her to the wall like an animal, when she gets out, and she will get out, she's going to kill everyone who had the slightest thing to do with it. She won't settle for anything less. He gives suggestions for what the Foundation can do to contain the creature, but above all, insists that she be kept alive. At this point, the interviewer points out that the agent has been visiting SCP-953 in her containment cell. He questions the agent's motives, suggesting he might have Stockholm Syndrome. The agent refuses to consider that possibility. In return, the interviewer has him taken to Site-51 for psychological analysis. The containment procedures are left unchanged. The interviewer includes this note with the transcription of the interview. On a side note, I am appalled by the level of superstition expressed by the agent throughout the course of this interview. I am recommending that his suggestions regarding containment be disregarded for a more scientific approach. We're not old Korean fishwives here. I'm sure we can think of something more effective than dogs and needles. Not long after the interview, SCP-953 escapes from custody, killing several Foundation personnel in the process. They managed to recapture her, but she escaped again, and again and again. After her sixth escape, the Foundation is unable to track her down. She remains unseen for years, sneaking around under the radar, as the Foundation waits for the inevitable bloodbath that will ensue when she gets bored enough. Years pass, and the date of the annual Yifcon rolls around again. This is of little interest to the Foundation. Why would they be monitoring the goings-on of a small furry convention? Well, maybe they should be, because there is no better place in the world for a foxwoman to pass unnoticed. If anything, with only her ears and tail showing through her human form, she's a bit underdressed compared to the rest of the attendees. A few convention-goers stop to admire the beautiful woman with the reddish-brown fox ears and tail, but most of them don't even give her a second glance. Unfortunately for the convention's attendees, she has far more malicious plans than supporting small businesses by purchasing some art or a body pillow. She passes out cards with her room number on them to various strangers, inviting them to an after-hours party in her room. With her friendly face and gorgeous smile, how could they say no? After all, it's a friendly event, and nothing bad ever happens at Yifcon. When a dozen anthropomorphic animal enthusiasts arrive at SCP-953's room, they find a few bottles of wine and an uneasy atmosphere. Still, they're excited to socialize and thrilled to have been invited to an after-hours party. They don't notice her sliding the deadbolt into place behind them, placing her body between them 
and their only exit. An hour later, another hotel guest calls the police to alert them to the sounds of horrific screams coming from down the hall. But when the police arrive, they can't hear anything. The place is eerily quiet. As they approach the offending room, they hear the sounds of a respectfully tame party inside, and a beautiful woman answers the door, assuring them that everything is fine. The officers turn and leave without a second thought, and as the victims inside the room continue to scream, the cops can't hear a thing. They don't know it, but they're trapped in her thrall. The next morning, a hotel housekeeper knocks on the door of the ill-fated room. No one answers, and there isn't a Do Not Disturb sign on the door, so she lets herself in. As soon as she opens the door, she regrets it. There, so engrossed in her gleeful bloodlust that she doesn't even notice the intrusion, is SCP-953, surrounded by dozens of corpses. The housekeeper calls 911, but after stuttering out a few words on the situation, a clawed hand grabs hold of her hair and yanks her back inside. The poor housekeeper will never be seen again. Not alive, anyway. Fortunately, it was enough information to alert the Foundation to the situation at hand. Unfortunately, by the time they arrive on the scene, there are over two dozen corpses littering the hotel floor. One is stuffed into a mattress, another hanging over a shower curtain rod, one rolled up in a carpet, and another is strewn across a banquet table. Any survivors are brought into Foundation custody and given Class A amnestics to wipe their memories. The convention concludes early, under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak. During the chaos, the Foundation managed to bring SCP-953 into custody. This time, they acknowledge the need to amend the containment procedures they have been using. They can't let her escape again. Today, SCP-953 is kept in a Type 4 containment cell at Site 17. She is provided the following necessities. Fresh liver daily, clean drinking water and plenty of it, a futon and clean bedding for it, which is laundered weekly. When she is on her best behavior and has been especially non-violent, she is occasionally presented with a small luxury item, such as a book, a dessert, or a bottle of plum wine. Direct human contact with SCP-953 has been strictly prohibited due to her psychic abilities. Delivery of her food or any other items is to be carried out by an automated robotic assistant. In addition to her physical containment, psychological measures with a folkloric origin have been employed. The entrance to her containment chamber is lined with open cage dog kennels containing Korean Jindo or American Foxhound dogs. She will not approach any canines out of an apparent aversion, especially when one is barking. SCP-953 is considered extremely hostile, dangerous, and armed at all times, given the nature of her razor-sharp claws and numerous deadly abilities. I found this addendum attached to her official file concerning folklore control procedures as they pertain to SCP-953. As a reminder, staff assigned to SCP-953 are to follow all instructions for interacting with the subject, no matter how odd or arbitrary they may seem. Keep in mind that the people of Asia interacted with these beings for centuries before we came onto the scene. What we think of as fairy tales were their version of special containment procedures. Personally, I hope to never encounter SCP-953 under any circumstances, though as I say that, a disquieting thought crosses my mind. It's entirely possible I have, at some point, and simply didn't know it. After all, she is capable of shifting her shape in countless ways and is a master of trickery and deception. I may very well have crossed paths with her before. I suppose I'll never know for sure. All I know is that I still have my liver. For now. And for that, I am very, very grateful. The young couple held hands as they walked through the forest, the only light coming from the full moon which streamed down between the branches. The young woman is riveted by her friend's story. She's never been a fan of ghost stories, she scares too easily, but her friends insisted. But what they didn't know was that there was something else out there in the forest, something watching them. The young woman can't help but look around, scanning the forest to see if there's anything out there watching her, but it's too dark to see anything past the dim ring of light cast by the campfire. Just then, something emerged from the forest. The couple had no idea that it was just feet behind them, matching them step for step. Slowly. It began to reach out towards them. What was it? The young woman instinctually asked. It was... The Gashadokuro! The young woman screams in fear as she is grabbed from behind by a skeleton. But of course, the laughing of her friends clues her in immediately that this is not a real Gashadokuro. It's just her stupid friend in a mask. 
No one can contain their laughter. Even the young woman has to laugh a little. As her friend takes off his cheap skull mask, she playfully hits him in the arm. You jerk. You should have seen the look on your... The gigantic shrieking skeleton leaps from the woods and picks up the young man, shoving him straight into his mouth and consuming him, the boy crying out as his bones are snapped between its enormous jaws. Everyone screams and turns to run, but another colossal skeleton emerges from the forest, picking up two of the group, one in each hand, before smashing them together over and over, leaving nothing but a tenderized pile of flesh between its bony fingers that it then begins to devour. The young woman doesn't know what to do. She's petrified with fear, unable to move or even think. She's grabbed from behind and turns to see her friend who is telling the story. Come on, we have to go. She still doesn't move. She can't tear herself away from watching the horror that's playing out in front of her. But he grabs her hand and forcefully pulls her into the forest behind him. As they run through the woods, they can hear the sounds of their friends being eaten by the enormous skeletons. There's nothing they can do to help them, though. All they can do is run. The two sprint as fast as they can through the thick, dark forest, jumping over fallen trees, hoping that there's solid ground on the other side. The young woman's foot catches in a root, and she falls hard to the ground. Her friend stops and quickly comes back. As he is helping her stand up out of the mud, they both notice something. A sound. The heavy thuds of another giant skeleton. And it's getting closer to them. Come on, we have to keep going! With a loud shriek, a huge bony hand emerges from the forest and grabs the young man. The young woman watches as he is lifted a hundred feet into the air and stuffed whole into the gargantuan skeleton's mouth. She steps slowly backwards, knowing that she will soon meet the same fate, until the earth disappears beneath her feet. She tumbles down the hillside, somersaulting end over end, crashing through the brush on the hillside until dropping over an embankment. If the fall down the hill knocked her out, then the drop over the embankment was enough to wake her back up. Her wits come back just enough for her to roll under the embankment's ledge, and not a moment too soon. She huddles under the ledge and watches as the two skeletons stride over her hiding place and continue on deeper into the forest. She listens until the sounds of their thudding steps disappear. She doesn't know what to do. Should she try to get back to the campsite and see if any of her friends are still alive? If they are, they might need her help. But what if there are more of these things out there? What if they come back, looking for her? Her mind races, unsure of what to do, and she has trouble thinking clearly. Her ears are ringing from her tumble down the hillside and her teeth audibly chatter in fear. As she debates her next move, trying to make sense of the nightmare she's found herself in, she suddenly notices something. A shadow cast by the moonlight begins to grow on the ground in front of her. That's when she realizes something else. It's not her teeth that are chattering. The sound is coming from somewhere else. She stands up and turns around to see a huge skull slowly rising up behind her. The giant skeleton, this one even bigger than the others, reaches out towards her. The girl closes her eyes, preparing to meet her fate as the skeleton starts to shriek. But it's a different kind of sound. She opens her eyes and is almost blinded by the intense white light on the skeleton's face. It sounds like it is shrieking in pain from the light being cast on it, and she's forced to turn away and shield her eyes. As she does so, she sees the source of light. It's a man in a uniform. He looks like some sort of tactical police officer, but instead of a gun, he's holding an enormous flashlight that he's pointing at the skeleton. More men who are dressed just the same emerge from the woods, blasting the skeleton with more light. It continues shrieking but seems helpless to do anything. She watches as the skeleton seems to lose its form, slowly disintegrating in the light, until eventually it disappears completely. Later, the young woman is sitting in the back of a van with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. One of the policemen, at least she thinks he must be a policeman, brings her a hot drink. She still can't believe what she saw that night. The monstrous creatures that killed and ate her friends, it felt like it wasn't real, like she was watching a movie play out. Were those... were those... Gasha Dokuro? She asks. A man in a white lab coat looks up from a nearby table where he had been working on something. She thinks he must be a doctor of some kind. Yes, he tells her, or something similar to them. Maybe they inspired the myth of the Gasha Dokuro? Maybe the myth inspired them? We simply don't know. She asks. All my friends are... Dead, he interjects. I know this is hard for you. Getting chased by giant anomalous skeletons and watching your friends eaten alive would be tough for anyone to deal with. The young woman starts to sob, the weight of the moment finally hitting her. But I have some good news, he tells her. She sniffs and looks up at the doctor. Believe it or not, I've seen this thing happen a lot. And you don't have to worry, because you're not going to remember any of this. Ouch! The young woman cries, and looks down to see that he has jabbed her in the thigh with a syringe. She tries to push him away, but she's already feeling weak and disoriented. 
She sways a little before her eyes shut, and she passes out. The young woman wakes in the cheery morning light of her own bedroom. She yawns and stretches, the strange dream about skeletons in the forest already drifting from her mind. Konnichiwa, I'm Dr. Bob, and today's file is a terrifying anomalous entity referred to in Japan as the Gashadokuro, but known by the SCP Foundation as SCP-2863, the Starving Skeletons. SCP-2863 is not just one, but an entire population of entities that resemble gigantic human skeletons. These enormous bony creatures' size can vary, but on average they are approximately 30 meters tall. While their exact number is unknown, over 200 separate individual instances have been identified and catalogued, with each having distinctive markings, such as their bones having different types of damage or burn marks present. SCP-2863 instances are currently found exclusively in Japan, where they will appear only after sunset. It is still unknown if the skeletons are sapient, though they do appear sentient as they engage in their primary behavior of hunting down and consuming humans. Despite their enormous size, they are capable of moving very quietly when they want to, though there have been reports from survivors of their appearance being preceded by a rattling-like sound, which may be their own teeth or giant bones hitting against each other. Once they have caught a human, they will immediately devour them, with the human's blood appearing to be absorbed directly into their bones, since they lack any digestive organs. It is unknown if they require the blood of humans for sustenance, or if their predatory behavior is motivated by something else. Monitoring and control of SCP-2863 instances was previously the responsibility of the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency. The IJAMEA, which as the name suggests, was Imperial Japan's answer to the SCP Foundation, tasked with investigating the strange anomalies within their own borders for the benefit of the Empire. Several of the IJAMEA agents who had been investigating the Gashidokuro at the end of World War II transferred to the SCP Foundation when the Anomalous Matters Examination Agency was disbanded and continued their work on the anomaly. They also provided their original files on the anomaly, which gave the Foundation their first information on the giant anomalous skeletons. According to the IJAMEA's translated file, Gashidokuro are created by mass death by the concentrated suffering of hundreds. While the Gashidokuro will eventually fade, they remain for centuries after their creation, lingering until their sorrow has diffused and faded. There is no way to hasten this process. The IJAMEA file also explained that while conventional weaponry is useless against the anomalous skeletons, light can be used to banish the creatures, and either natural daylight or man-made light will suffice. When exposed to light, the skeletons will start to lose their corporeal form until they fade away completely. This doesn't kill instances of SCP-2863 though, it only temporarily neutralizes them, and appearances of the same instance will often be reported the very next night. Just as the IJAMEA had noted in their file, the SCP Foundation also made the connection between SCP-2863 and locations of mass suffering. While Imperial Japan's Anomalous Investigation Unit identified 203 instances of SCP-2863, the Foundation has since become aware of three others, each of which were found at sites connected to death and destruction. The first new instance was found near Nanjing, China, the location of an especially brutal massacre during the Second World War that may have resulted in as many as 300,000 deaths. It's believed that the entity first appeared in this location in 1938, just after the massacre while the city was still under the control of Imperial Japan. This has led some to speculate that the locations where Gashidokuro appear are inherently tied to the borders of Japan as a nation and have fluctuated with geopolitical changes. The second was discovered several kilometers from Fukuoka City in Japan, a city that saw heavy firebombing by Allied forces during the war. The third was identified in 2011 in the Tohoku region of Japan, which is where the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred. Each of these new instances appeared to bear injuries consistent with someone who suffered through the nearby tragedies, with the first showing evidence of crushed bones, the second appearing to have suffered intense burning, and the third missing teeth, which is common in cases of extreme radiation poisoning. These specific injuries add further evidence of the connection the Gashidokuro may have to human misery. The impermanent nature of SCP-2863 and their ability to manifest even after being neutralized has made long-term containment of this anomaly all but impossible, and they have been classified as Keter. In the event that an instance is spotted, Mobile Task Force Omicron 3 is dispatched to the area, where they will attempt to neutralize the entity through the use of high-powered floodlights. Any civilians who are exposed to SCP-2863 and survive are given Class A amnestics so that they can hopefully move on with their lives and forget their horrifying encounter with the starving skeletons.
The group of children on their bikes stare intently at the large, abandoned house. Rumors have been circulating all school year about a monster that lives inside. One child tells the others about the kid from a couple towns over who went inside and never came back out, and it's easy to believe that something evil could be lurking inside the rundown home with its peeling paint and many broken windows. The children begin teasing each other, daring one another to go in and see the monster for themselves. No one seems especially eager to volunteer, though, as they all egg each other on. As the group of children joke about who should be forced to go inside, another comes riding up behind them, struggling to catch his breath. You left me behind again, he complains. Clearly, this is not the first time that this smallest child of the group has been made to try and keep up with his bigger and faster friends. The bigger kids all turn to look at him. They don't need to discuss it any further. The answer to who must go inside has already been decided. The smaller child tries to protest, but ultimately, what decision does he have but to go inside? He can't let everyone else think that he's a chicken. He's got to prove once and for all that he's just as tough as any of them. Without another word, he lets his bike fall into the dirt and makes his way towards the big, creepy house. The door pushes open without any resistance, and the boy looks into the dark house. The boy steps inside, and the floorboards creak loudly under his feet. The inside looks much like the outside, old, worn, and abandoned. But then, he hears something, a scratching noise coming from above him. He turns to leave, but he can see all of his friends through the doorway, and they motion for him to keep going. The boy steals his nerves and turns back. He's going to show them just how brave he is. The boy starts up the stairs, each one groaning as he steps onto it. He reaches the top of the stairs to find a landing with more rooms, each full of dirt and debris. There's spray paint on many of the walls and lots of trash. It looks like teens may use this as a place to hang out. But there at the other side of the landing is one more room, and the door is shut. From outside, the group of children can see through the upper windows as the boy makes his way through the house. They're not laughing and teasing any longer. In fact, they're impressed by how bravely he is exploring the old home. Though none of them would admit it out loud, he's earning their respect. The boy reaches the shut door at the end of the hall and presses his ear to it, but he doesn't hear anything inside. He places his hand on the doorknob and slowly opens it. The boy screams and falls backwards as the cat that was hiding inside panics and jumps through one of the open windows. The boy can't help but laugh. <laughs> of course it was just a… The boy screams again as the floor gives way beneath him and he crashes down onto the first floor in a pile of debris. He's stunned by the fall before starting to scream again as that floor gives way too. His yelling is silenced by the air being knocked out of him as he hits the basement floor. He's covered in dust and pieces of two floors he fell through. He feels bruised and sore, but he can wiggle his fingers and toes. He's not paralyzed, and it doesn't even feel like he's broken a bone. Maybe he's okay. But no, he's definitely not okay. Because suddenly, there's something picking him up off the floor. As his eyes adjust to the dark basement, he sees what it is that's holding him. It's half man, half machine, a huge disgusting mix of metal and flesh. The boy is too scared to scream anymore as the creature's unmoving, dead-looking eyes stare straight into his. Its face looks as though the skin has been stretched across a human metallic skull. The boy can only watch as the monster raises its sharp metallic fingers and brushes the dirt out of the boy's hair. The boy starts to whimper, but whatever this thing is, it doesn't seem to want to hurt him. A tinny, robotic voice coming from a small device on the creature's face suddenly breaks the silence. Al anta ala mayuram. The boy doesn't understand, but the robotic man tilts his horrific head to the side and repeats the same thing. The boy is still confused, but he feels like the robot is trying to tell him something. He somehow gets the sense that it's not going to hurt him. Is this the monster that everyone has been afraid of? A misunderstood machine man living down here in the basement? The robot flinches as something is smashed on the back of his head. He tosses the boy to the side and turns to see the boy's friends, each of them armed with pieces of wood and other scraps as weapons. They've come here to save their friend from the monster that they dared him to find. Another runs up to strike the robot, but before he can reach him, he falls to his knees in pain, as do the rest of the children. The creature has begun emitting a high-frequency noise, and the children try to cover their ears. They all feel a searing pain that makes it feel as though their heads will explode. The piercing noise continues to ring out, but the monster looks like it has entered some kind of dormant state and is no longer moving. The small boy is able to slowly get back to his knees, hands still clasped to the side of his head, and stand up. He runs past the monster and his friends who are writhing on the floor in pain, up the stairs and out of the old house. A woman stands at a kitchen counter. 
chopping vegetables for their dinner that evening, and talking to her oldest daughter about her plans for that weekend, when the back door suddenly bursts open. Standing there is her son, the small boy. He's barely able to whisper the words, Monster. There's a monster in the basement. Before he collapses, blood pouring from his ears and nose, before he begins convulsing on the floor. At the local police station, an officer is speaking on the phone. I see. Yes, that is quite strange. A metal man? You don't say. I'll send someone out there right away. Don't go anywhere. The police officer hangs up the phone and looks around, making sure no one is nearby or listening to him, and then takes out his cell phone. He dials a number from memory, and someone answers on the other end almost immediately. Yes, this is Field Agent Patch, the police officer says. You need to get a containment team out here right away, and a good one too. I don't know what it is, but it's dangerous. An SCP Foundation mobile task force that specializes in containing dangerous humanoid threats soon arrived at the house and took the anomaly into captivity. Misinformation teams concocted a cover story about a gas leak leading to the unfortunate deaths of several of the town's children and administering amnestics to any potential witnesses. Once the messy business of containment was over, though, it was time to figure out just what this strange creature was. SCP-203 appears to have at one time been a Caucasian human male, though its appearance now is far different than it once was. This bipedal humanoid creature stands 2.5 meters tall and weighs roughly 200 kilograms. Both its incredible height and weight are due to the fact that the man's original skeleton has been entirely removed and replaced with a mechanical framework made of cast iron. The metal skeleton is much larger than the original bones, and in many places SCP-203's skin has split from being stretched over it, revealing the mechanical structure underneath. Other parts of the framework appear to have been intentionally made to protrude through the skin, though it is unclear for what purpose. In addition to this larger-than-normal mechanical skeleton, a number of other augmentations are present on SCP-203. Its fingers have been extended into sharpened, hook-like barbs that are approximately one meter long. Its lips have been removed entirely, making it clear that there is no movable jawbone and that the skull is likely one large hollow piece of metal and there are several more hook-like protrusions jutting out around the mouth area, smaller but similar in appearance to the fingers. SCP-203's legs have been modified as well, with two added joints that give them an appearance more akin to a dog's and its toes have been removed and replaced with a solid piece of metal similar to those found in steel-toed boots. Its chest has no sternum or breastplate, which causes the skin stretched across to pull inward as its diaphragm contracts. Its ears have also been removed, though it still seems to possess hearing that is far beyond that of an average human. And while its eyes still remain, they are held in a permanently forward-facing position by several needles that emerge from the eye sockets. The irises also appear permanently dilated and do not react to light. In place of a mouth is a small speaker covered by a metal grate that is capable of producing basic vocalizations, though with a distinctly robotic sound to them. Tests have shown that SCP-203 has a basic understanding of English, but its own primary language seems to be a type of Arabic, though there are no records of the exact dialect. SCP-203 does not need to eat or drink, and without any visible mouth, it is likely incapable of either. Instead, it runs off of a power cell located within its body that will provide energy for up to 72 hours. After those three days, SCP-203 will shut down and enter a hibernation state for three to four hours, during which its power source will recharge, providing it with another 72 hours of energy. All attempts to examine SCP-203 by either X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and other forms of diagnostic imagery have failed, and attempts at exploratory surgery have triggered its defense mechanisms, which are both painful and deadly. When it perceives that it is being threatened in some way, SCP-203 is capable of emitting a high-frequency droning sound that has a profoundly damaging effect on the human nervous system. The effects of this defense mechanism were able to be observed directly when a D-Class personnel accidentally struck SCP-203 and its droning sound was activated. Immediately after being exposed to the sound, D-104 experienced a severe headache. After 15 minutes, the headache grew worse and D-104 began to bleed from the ears. After a half hour, the D-Class who had now gone to the infirmary began to experience seizures and was bleeding from all of his orifices. Ten minutes later, the D-Class was dead. Another test was performed, and the results were nearly identical, with symptoms progressing at roughly the same rate. However, this time, rather than move the D-Class to the infirmary, it was kept in the cell with SCP-203. After 40 minutes, the D-Class was dead, and a few minutes later, 203 finally ceased its droning sound. 
SCP-203 then approached the body of the deceased D-Class and began to use its own augmentations to start removing the skeleton of the D-Class. While SCP-203 was stopped before it could complete its task, it now appears that the droning sound it produces is a defense mechanism but may also be a part of the process by which it creates new instances of SCP-203. In interviews with SCP-203, it claims to have no memories of its life prior to its augmentation. It says that it now exists in a near constant state of pain and confusion, and that the times when its battery is expended and it enters a rest state are its only escape from the pain of its existence. It also claims that it has no memory of what happens once its defense mechanism is activated, nor does it remember what it did to the body of the D-Class that was left in its cell. However, it is unknown just how truthful SCP-203 is being. There has been no way to verify anything that SCP-203 tells researchers, and for the time being, its statements are to be regarded by Foundation staff as an attempt to elicit sympathy or otherwise manipulate them emotionally. It's made several requests for pain-killing medication and anesthetics, but so far, all of these requests have been denied. SCP-203 has been classified as Euclid, and it is kept in a specialized storage bunker at a research site. Two D-Class personnel equipped with sound filtering equipment guard it at all times, and it is accompanied by an armed escort to any testing or research sessions. Is SCP-203 the ultimate victim? A normal human that was transformed against his will into a crude amalgamation of man and machine? Maybe there is something more to SCP-203, or rather, less. Is SCP-203 fooling all of us? Is this tortured iron soul nothing more than a metallic monster disguising itself with the skin of its last victim? Perhaps with more research, we will one day know the answer. There's nothing like winding down for the evening with some lighthearted television. Just grab an ice cold drink, kick up your feet, and get ready to relax and laugh. Wait, what's happening? Your eyes are starting to feel wrong, too large for your skull. They widen and bulge as your body warps and shifts. As it turns out, when you apply cartoon logic to the human body, it gets ugly. But what could have caused this? Just watching TV can't hurt you, right? After a long week at the office, all the businessman wants to do with his Friday night is sit back and indulge in a bit of good old-fashioned channel surfing. It's been his close of the week ritual as long as he's lived in his current apartment building. The building isn't much to look at, and sure, the pipes leak from time to time, and he spots the occasional roach scuttling across the bathroom floor. But all of that is worth it, for the love of his life. Cable Television This building has something no other building in the neighborhood does. Cable, included in the building's utilities. Most of his peers have turned their backs on cable in this era dominated by streaming services, but nothing beats the pure dopamine rush of switching from his slacks to his sweatpants ordering a pizza, and clicking from channel to channel the old-fashioned way. But when he hauls his body up the stairs and reaches the door to his apartment, he spots a slip of paper taped to the door. What's this? He inspects the paper and finds a notice from the landlord. No, it can't be. The cable service to the building has been suspended, effective immediately. He rushes inside and turns on the TV, and his stomach drops. The channels. Where are his beloved channels? They're all gone, replaced with the same devastating static on each and every one. Why would they do this, and with no warning? No, surely there's something he can do. He'll approach this obstacle the same way he solves all of his problems, with a quick Google search. How to access TV channels without cable. He scrolls through the advertisements until he finds a forum post that might actually be useful. He can reconnect the wires in the cable box in a specific configuration then carve a symbol into the side of the box with a knife, and it should allow him to access his channels again. It sounds silly, sure, but he's willing to do just about anything that doesn't involve spending any money. So he unplugs the box, opens it up, rearranges some wires, seals it back up, and carves in the arcane symbol. All in all, it takes about 20 minutes. He finishes up just as the pizza arrives. Perfect timing. But will it work? Probably not, but again, it's worth a shot, right? He picks up the remote and switches the television back on. Much to his surprise and immediate delight, it works. He has picture again. The channels look a bit different, but that's to be expected. He's just relieved he has anything to watch at all. With that fire sufficiently extinguished, he changes into his sweatpants, 
sets the pizza down on the coffee table, and gets ready for some premium relaxation. He clicks from channel to channel, watching the images flicker from show to show. Round and round the channels go. Where they stop, nobody knows. But where will he land? What will be tonight's entertainment? As if in direct answer to his unspoken question, he flips to a channel with a number he doesn't recognize. In fact, there isn't a number at all. In the top right corner of the screen, where the number would be, there's just the letter X. Unfamiliar channel aside, the image on screen is not just recognizable, but welcome. He managed to flip to channel X just in time to watch his favorite cartoon family pile onto the couch together. Perfect, it's an episode of The Simpsons. This is the most satisfying part of channel surfing, the moment where he stumbles on a favorite show at just the right moment. Now to enjoy the fruits of his channel flipping and find out which episode of his number one favorite show this is. As the story begins to unfold, the man realizes that he doesn't recognize anything that's happening. It must be a new episode, even better. But as the episode continues, something begins to cause his hair to stand to attention. A shiver runs down his back. He can't quite explain it, but something about this episode feels… wrong. The standard story beats are all there. Homer is failing to live up to his role as an employee, a father, a husband, with absurd ramifications. Lisa is a thoughtful prodigy and frustrated with her family's antics. Bart causes trouble and invites anyone who questions it to eat his shorts. Marge is trying her best to hold the family together. And of course, Maggie is a baby who displays much more cleverness than a baby ought to. Standard Simpsons fare. But every so often, the man can swear that he sees the character's eyes flick to the side, staring right down the barrel of the camera. Except, of course, there is no camera. This is a cartoon. It must be some sort of deliberate stylistic choice, a joke that's flying over his head. But he's not laughing. Something about the sudden panic in the character's eyes as their gaze momentarily locks with his makes his heart race with dread. As the episode continues, the man begins to recognize several of the storylines. Marge is working as a police officer, the kids are persuading Homer to buy a swimming pool for the house, but none of these storylines happened in the same episode. What's going on? It's as if someone cut a bunch of season 6 episodes of the show together and added this bizarre effect with the eyes. The man considers flipping to another channel, but he can't quite bring himself to look away. He watches, helplessly glued to the couch, as the remainder of the episode plays out before him. The pizza grows cold untouched, as his eyes stay locked on the screen. Ned Flanders walks over to the Simpson home to deliver a standard, Hi diddly ho, neighborino, much to Homer's dismay. But he doesn't respond the usual Homer way. He grabs Ned by the collar of his sweater, hauling him into the pool. That's fine enough, but as Ned thrashes in the water, struggling to pull himself back out, Homer presses a hand down on top of his neighbor's head, forcing him back under. He holds the man under the surface, watching the bubbles of his neighbor's screams with the dispassionate look in his cartoon eyes. Eventually, the bubbles stop, and Homer retrieves his hand. A body floats there in the water, face down. A pair of round glasses sink to the bottom of the pool. The camera pans to the rest of the Simpson family, who look on in abject horror. Maggie's jaw drops, and her pacifier falls to the ground. Marge, still in her policewoman garb, reaches for the weapon in her holster. Homer's serious face breaks, and he begins to laugh. His eyes roll wildly, his mouth stretches until it warps his entire face, and the blood vessels in his eyes begin to burst. Then he laughs some more. Flashing red and blue lights illuminate his face, and then the episode cuts to black. No credits. The man realizes for the first time since the episode began that there hasn't been one single commercial break. Now the episode is over, leaving the man alone with nothing but a dark screen and troubled thoughts. Ordinarily, he'd stay awake and keep watching television until his eyes begin to hurt, but not tonight. He's had enough TV for tonight, maybe for a lifetime. He puts the uneaten pizza in the fridge, switches off the television, and heads to bed. The man doesn't sleep, though. At least he doesn't sleep well. He tosses and turns, soaking the sheets with cold, anxious sweat as his mind replays the bizarre episode over and over again. He can't get it out of his head. When morning comes and his alarm goes off, he feels as though he hasn't gotten a moment's rest. 
Thankfully, it's the weekend, so he can hit the snooze and get some more sleep. Wait a second. As he reaches for the snooze button, something catches his eye. His hand looks quite a bit more yellow than it did the night before. A trick of the light? He sits up and switches on his bedside lamp. No, his skin is definitely taken on a yellow tint. Could he be sick? He feels perfectly fine, aside from the exhaustion of a somewhat sleepless night. No fever, no nausea. In fact, he feels hungry, starving even. He remembers the pizza in the fridge, waiting for him. Sounds like the breakfast of champions to him. He grabs the box and plants himself in front of the television again. Wait, if he turns it on, what horrors will be waiting for him? He decides to try his luck and switch it on. Thankfully, the Simpsons episode playing this morning seems to be a perfectly normal one. He polishes off the pizza and enjoys the show. By the time the weekend is over, the man feels quite different. He's always been a diligent worker during business hours, but now he can't bring himself to care about his job. He calls in sick on Monday morning, faking a cough so he can stay in and watch more TV. Thankfully, there's no wife or kids to bother him and try to get him off the couch. He spends the week like that, snacks and television and calling out of work. One week turns into two, and as the days pass, the man's transformation continues. He's not just changing on the inside, the outside is shifting to match. His hair begins to come out in pieces, covering his pillowcase in the morning, clogging the drain of his shower. Before long, he is completely bald. The yellowish tinge of his skin intensifies too, until he is the same shade of yellow as the cartoon family on the TV screen. He doesn't notice the similarities, however, just as a fish doesn't notice the water it swims in. He can't observe the effects from the inside, at least not yet. As two weeks become three, the changes become uncomfortable, even painful. His job calls to let him know that he's been fired for his unexcused absences, but that is the least of the man's problems. Suddenly, he can't sleep. Well, he could sleep if he could just get his eyes to close, but he can't. For some reason, his eyelids won't cover them the way they used to. For the first time in weeks, he stumbles to his bathroom mirror to take a look. When he sees his reflection, he cries out in shock. His eyes would go wide, but they can't go any wider. The eyeballs have grown so large that they jut out, protruding from his face dramatically. He can't close them because they've extended out too far for the lids to close anymore. Something is terribly wrong, clearly. He's been putting it off, ignoring the problem, but he can't deny it any longer. He needs to go to the doctor and find out what mysterious illness is doing this to him. But first, he should stop for some donuts on the way. He's got the strongest craving for a donut with pink frosting and sprinkles. Or how about a dozen donuts? Maybe with a beer to wash it all down. Then he'll go to the doctor after. As he descends the stairs of the apartment building, the man becomes suddenly aware of how heavy and cumbersome his legs feel beneath him. He never struggled with walking before, but now it feels like a nearly impossible task. His body feels as if it won't listen to his commands. His muscles feel sluggish, and his bones softer somehow. Then he makes one wrong step, and his ankle gives out, rolling to the side with a snap. He loses his balance, pain shooting fireworks across his field of vision. His enlarged eyes roll in their sockets, wide with terror, at the sudden realization that he is falling. And he keeps falling, tumbling down one stair after another in a horrific pratfall that carries him down two flights of stairs until he lands at the bottom with a sickening crack. His dying words, just before his head collides with the pavement, are few and simple. He cries out in pain, in fear, in resignation, one word. Don't! When the police find the body, they aren't sure what to make of it. None of them, even the most seasoned officers, have ever seen something quite so bizarre. It would almost be funny if it weren't so terrible. But it is terrible, and they can't let anyone else see it. So they carry the poor yellow son of a gun out of sight and call their contacts at an organization that specializes in this sort of thing. When the SCP Foundation comes to examine the body, they have no idea what to make of it either. They take the body back to a Foundation morgue, where it will sit on ice for decades until the Foundation eventually discovers some context, until an obscure Foundation initiative uncovers the secrets of SCP-7066.
The SCP Foundation's Department of Metaphysics developed an initiative tasked with containing dangerous anomalies in parallel realities without SCP Foundations. Whether these parallel foundations became defunct or simply never existed in the first place, the lack of Foundation presence in these other realities presented a problem that this initiative hoped to correct. And so, on August 7, 2047, Parallel Universe ASX number 623 was investigated for potential dangers. I should note that prior to its discovery, this particular universe is believed to have undergone a large-scale XK class end-of-the-world scenario. The specific details of this are unknown, but significant damage to the surface of the planet, as well as a dramatically decreased human population, point to some manner of apocalyptic disaster. This fact casts the findings of this particular expedition in an even stranger, more disconcerting light. In the ruins of Los Angeles, California, in an abandoned Fox recording studio, the expedition team found signs of recent habitation. Food was left out and had not yet begun to visibly spoil. Surfaces were remarkably free of dust. Human remains found in the building were determined to be only a few days old. Down in a hidden sub-basement of the building, over a dozen bodies were found, displaying anomalous conditions. On a television hooked up to a DVD player, something was playing. The bright colors, familiar soundtrack, and instantly recognizable characters made the show unmistakable. It was The Simpsons. The DVD was removed from the player and placed back in its corresponding case. Then, it was transported to the SCP Foundation back in the universe that we all know, occupy, and occasionally love, where it was designated SCP-7066. SCP-7066 is an anomalous Blu-ray DVD copy of the sixth season of beloved animated sitcom The Simpsons, created by American cartoonist Matt Groening in the late 1980s. As you might have already surmised, this is no ordinary Simpsons DVD. Anyone who views the contents of SCP-7066 will find themselves the unfortunate subject of a variety of unpleasant and unusual anomalous phenomena shortly after watching. Though it varies a bit from subject to subject, the anomalous effects tend to follow a specific timeline. Between three and five days after the DVD is first viewed, the subject will begin to show severe behavioral changes. Specifically, regardless of their initial personality or prior habits, they will show an increased tendency toward indolence, alcoholism, and ineptitude at their chosen profession, as well as ordinary daily tasks. Between five and ten days after exposure to SCP-7066, physical abnormalities will begin to manifest. First, there's rapid hair loss, hair falling out in chunks until the subject is almost completely bald. Next, their skin will begin to discolor, taking on a jaundiced, yellowish tone. Tumors will begin to form throughout their body, made up of excess fat similar to a lipoma. After 10 to 15 days, the subject's legs will begin to atrophy due to the weight of these tumoral growths. At some point between the 15 and 20 day mark, the subject's eyes will begin to protrude from their face, bulging out in a severe form of exophthalmos, or proptosis. This causes discomfort, distress, and difficulty closing their eyes, resulting in a disruption of ordinary sleep patterns. All the while, the yellowish tint of the skin becomes more pronounced. Eventually, after one month has passed, the fatty tumors will spread throughout the subject's entire body. Their voice will begin to deepen, and new oral cavities will form in the subject's neck and torso to accommodate the presence of these additional tumors. At this point, the anomalous effects cease, leaving the subject transformed. They are now a rotund, clumsy, cartoonishly yellow, bald person with a tendency toward alcoholism and incompetence. If you're beginning to think that sounds a bit familiar, well, you'd be correct. Testing logs for this particular anomaly have been sealed, and I'm afraid that I lack the adequate security clearance to access them. However, I have a feeling that these anomalous effects may present differently in different subjects. If male test subjects begin to resemble Homer Simpson, might other demographics take on the appearance of other members of the Simpson family? Perhaps a woman over a certain age would find her hair changing color and texture until it becomes a thick, blue beehive hairdo. Perhaps children would be affected, their hair spiking and transforming into the same shade of yellow as their skin. I shudder to think what this anomaly might do to a baby. Of course, these musings are purely hypothetical. It would be unethical to subject any human being to these effects, let alone children. Though I am always in pursuit of the truth, 
some questions are best left unanswered when the alternative relies on more human suffering. Remember those bodies I mentioned, the ones found at the abandoned Fox studio? All of them displayed these anomalous properties, transformed into disturbing, live-action Homer Simpson-esque beings. It is uncertain whether the transformations themselves resulted in these deaths, or whether their deaths were caused by something else. Perhaps they experienced acute liver failure related to the anomaly-induced alcoholism. Perhaps they were eliminated in a deliberate attempt to cover the tracks of whoever made the DVD. Either way, it is not a fate I would wish on anyone. SCP-7066 is currently stored in a standard low-priority anomalous item locker at Foundation Site-19. After a decision by the Ethics Committee, who reached a majority vote on the matter, all testing with the anomaly has been discontinued indefinitely. Oh, and I almost forgot, there was one detail that I omitted in my previous discussion of the anomaly's discovery. When SCP-7066 was first found in that concealed sub-basement, there was a worn post-it note attached to the VCR display. The writing, though faded, was still legible. It read as follows. Need to iron out a few kinks, but this should be enough to hold us off, for now. It's been a rough 60 years, Matt, but we'll weather this. We always do. I promise. Call me when you're ready. The show must go on. What exactly that ominous post-it note means remains to be seen. The origins of SCP-7066 are still being investigated, but it seems as if a parallel universe's version of Matt Groening was involved in something strange and unsavory. It's difficult to say for certain, but we should all be glad that this version of the show is being kept off the airwaves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to leave the research behind for now. I don't know about you, but I have a sudden craving for a donut. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Long, gnarled claws curl around the leg of the wounded villager, dragging them through the snow like a rag doll. Darkness is falling, the air is freezing, and yet, the poor doomed soul being pulled towards a horrific fate by the ancient hunched figure is smiling blissfully. In the forest, every sound, no matter how small, puts you on edge. The snap of a twig underfoot, the rustle of leaves overhead, the wind passing between the trees, all conjures up images of something else out there, watching, following, hunting you. The backpacker takes another cursory glance over his shoulder, the nagging thought that maybe he should turn back and retrace his steps to the main road, poking at his brain. It's not too late, the tiny voice tells him. You can make it back before dark. Someone is bound to come along who can help. He looks back to his map, squinting in the fleeting sunlight. There's a town nearby, a small place just off the beaten track. Cutting through the woods is the quickest way to get there, and he can't help but invite the possibility that he's only a few feet away from the furthest edge of the tree line. Just a little bit further can't hurt. And if he doesn't make it to the town by the time the sun fully sets, then he can turn back before it's too late. He should have turned back sooner. The backpacker has been crossing Eastern Europe for the past few months, traveling mostly on foot up until now. But walking through the freezing, rural areas of southern Russia was a quick way to get pneumonia, so he'd been opting to hitchhike until he made his way to a warmer part of the country. Most people were wary of picking him up and helping him get from one point to the next. The few that weren't, thankfully, spoke enough English to make communication possible. Thanks to his persistence and broken Russian, the backpacker had made it a decent distance. That is, until the most recent ride he'd hitched. He wasn't sure why, or even really what had happened. The driver who'd picked him up alongside the highway had seemed amicable enough, right up until he'd taken an unexpected detour. The backpacker had been keeping a close eye on his map and noticed the driver turn off at a different exit, pulling up alongside the forest on a long, empty stretch of highway. Suddenly, the driver started aggressively yelling at him, urging him to leave the vehicle immediately. The backpacker had thought maybe there was some kind of misunderstanding and could barely keep up with the thick Russian being hurled at him. But then, the driver sped away, laughing loudly with his windows down. He yelled something back at the backpacker but only one phrase stood out to him as the car receded into the distance. Baba Yaga. Now, lost in the woods, the sun rapidly disappearing, the backpacker tries desperately to keep hold of his bearings. That town is close, only a few feet away. It has to be, he tells himself, too close to justify turning back and trying to hail another passing car. He produces a pocket flashlight, its dim beam betraying just how small its remaining battery life is. 
The low light creates a few tiny glimmers in the snow, but they do little to dull the sense of worry that's rising higher and higher in the backpacker. A twig snaps, too far away for it to have been caused by his own footstep. The backpacker's heart jumps in his chest, and he turns to point his flashlight in the direction of the sound. His trembling, freezing fingers cause the light to shudder as it falls over a figure, standing in a clearing not far from him. They're hunched over, the kind of posture that typically comes with old age, dragging a person's upper body closer and closer to the ground, but he can't get a clear look at them. Their back is turned. The backpacker calls out, trying to recall some of his guidebook's typical Russian greetings to get the person's attention. The figure turns and speaks, saying something in a low, raspy voice. It sounds close to the Russian language, but a dialect that's far too old for a novice like the backpacker to recognize, let alone understand. He cautiously steps closer, the flashlight revealing the figure is an elderly woman. What's she doing out here in the forest, all alone at night? The backpacker tries to ask for directions, mentioning the name of the small town he saw nearby on the map, just the other side of the forest. And then, he sees her. The old woman, illuminated under the flickering light. Her skin is wrinkled, covered in pockmarks and deep lines, and her beady black eyes stare out at him. Saliva drips from her mouth, dribbling down her chin. Each finger is tipped with a rotting, overgrown yellow nail, protruding out of her bony fingers like talons. And the entire time he looks at her, the backpacker can think only one thing. One phrase that the driver who intentionally abandoned him here said, and why it had sounded so familiar. Baba Yaga, a creature from local folklore who dwelled in the forests and lured people to their deaths. One that typically took the form of a decrepit old woman. As the flashlight in his frozen hand blinks off, the backpacker turns heel and dashes through the trees. The rational part of his brain has been drowned out by the screaming, terrified panic. He throws off his heavy backpack, not daring to so much as peek over his shoulder for fear of seeing the face of the old woman in his peripheral vision, her claw-like hands reaching for him to tear him to shreds. Freed from his own cumbersome belongings, he rushes back through the forest, hoping he is going the same way he came. Something lightly brushes at his skin, causing him to scream and splutter, swiping his hands to try and swat it away. Light, thin cobwebs cling to him as the backpacker tries to clear them from his arms, face, and hair. Then, suddenly, he feels calm again. Better than calm. He feels good, as if he wasn't just fleeing for his life. The dark of the forest around him seems to brighten, and he lies down on the snow-covered ground with a relaxed sigh. He doesn't even notice the old woman slowly shuffling towards him, or feel her teeth sinking into his flesh. A report of a missing hitchhiker was filed after a man was caught bragging in a bar about ditching someone on the side of the road. Local authorities questioned the driver and asked him why he'd left an innocent backpacker to potentially die in the freezing forest. The driver simply chuckled and sneered in Russian. The Baba Yaga needs to eat. Humanoid SCPs can often be some of the most unsettling of all the anomalies that the Foundation can encounter. Sure, the sight of a creature like SCP-682 or SCP-096 is often terrifying in both their ferocity and the danger they present. But there's something about a being that looks almost human, but isn't, that can be particularly unnerving. It's the sense of familiarity, the appearance of another person that causes us to subconsciously lower our guard and relax, only to be rewarded for being so trusting with a swift and brutal death. Such is the case with SCP-352, often referred to by the name it is given in Slavic folklore, Baba Yaga. Now, while you might be forgiven for believing that this name refers to the Boogeyman, or synonymous with a hitman known for being the person to call if you wanted to kill said Boogeyman, the reality is a little different. According to tales from Eastern Europe that date back centuries, the Baba Yaga is a creature that dwells deep in the heart of the forest, bearing the appearance of an old woman, often described as appearing particularly grotesque. The Baba Yaga of legend differs from our notion of what we might call the Boogeyman, existing solely to cause some form of supernatural torment to others. Instead, Baba Yaga is more often considered to be a more ambiguous figure, who will either hinder or provide aid to any who encounter her should they seek her out in the forests. Some stories have even portrayed her as a sympathetic, maternal creature, responsible for the protection of wildlife. The point being, Baba Yaga is far more of a mysterious and multifaceted being than you may think. 
at least according to the stories. Much like the legends often suggest, SCP-352 also appears to be an old, emaciated woman. So old, in fact, that it's hard to determine her exact age. Little is known about her exact origins, however, what has been documented by the SCP Foundation is her speech patterns. SCP-352 exclusively speaks in a dialect reminiscent of Old Russian, the medieval precursor to the modern Russian language. Despite this, however, her thick accent and regional dialect have made it nearly impossible to translate anything she says, even by the Foundation's most accomplished linguistic experts. What also doesn't help is just how little SCP-352 is willing to communicate. The few times she has, and from what sparse patterns of her speech are decipherable, SCP-352 offers little information and instead only gives out threats and vows of one day having her revenge. Given how highly aggressive in nature she is, SCP-352 has never given the Foundation her name or revealed if she even has one. Next to no background information has been uncovered about her, either through attempting to converse with SCP-352 directly or by conducting research into her past. Now, a hostile and uncooperative elderly woman who doesn't like to communicate outside of threats might not seem all that unsettling, unless you've worked in retail, but it's true that from the outside, there doesn't appear to be anything all that anomalous or even unsettling about SCP-352. At first, at least. But the notion of her being a harmless old lady fades away in an instant as soon as you get a glimpse of the monster within. Looks, after all, can be deceiving. And with SCP-352, deception seems to be the intention. Foundation researchers have discovered that this anomaly, whilst seeming like a frail old lady, actually possesses a level of strength far beyond that typical of an ordinary human at her apparent age. The same can also be said of her speed, given she is far faster than should be possible, especially given her apparently weaker stature. Yet despite the assumptions that can be made from her external attributes, SCP-352 has been known to move masses in excess of 200 kilos with little difficulty, as well as moving at speeds of around 70 kilometers per hour. Those feats would be considered superhuman for an elite athlete, let alone a seemingly decrepit old woman. But then again, even the most accomplished and athletic person can't regenerate wounds. SCP-352, on the other hand, has been observed to have the ability of rapid cellular repair, healing from injuries that would be otherwise fatal to an ordinary person. This includes even extreme instances of bodily damage. While the reconstruction of her body can take anywhere between a few days to several weeks, and perhaps isn't as fast as some other entities, it does mean that little can be done to permanently destroy SCP-352. However, curiously, according to analysis by research teams, she still appears to be human, at least internally. She possesses muscles, bones, and internal organs that are all in a state of advanced aging, seemingly consistent with her external elderly appearance in a way that her anomalous speed, strength, and bodily regeneration aren't. But these factors alone certainly seem like tenuous reasons to nickname SCP-352 after the infamous Baba Yaga of Eastern European folklore. There must be a more cogent explanation as to why some among the Foundation are scared to even go near her, believing her to really be the terrifying, decrepit, forest-dwelling figure of legend. And it's true, there's certainly more to this anomaly than some enhanced abilities and apparent immortality. For one, SCP-352 possesses the ability to grow thin strands of a hair-like substance from any part of her body and can seemingly do so at will. This thin biological thread of sorts can grow to be several meters in length within the span of only an hour. What's more, SCP-352 can also directly control these threads. While she has been in containment at the Foundation, staff are not permitted to interact with SCP-352 directly. However, during observation by personnel, these threads that grow from her body have been seen crawling up walls and across the floor of her containment chamber. An individual one of these threads is thinner and weaker than the consistency and tensile strength of ordinary human hair, although they are also clear, making them almost invisible to the naked eye, unless enough of a mass of them is present. Further analysis of these strands reveals that they're coated in a layer of enzyme that is unique to SCP-352. Although present in all of her bodily tissue, this enzyme that SCP-352 produces is at its highest level of concentration within the anomaly's saliva and hair. Chemical analysis conducted by Foundation researchers has still failed to determine the exact makeup of the enzyme itself. However, 
the side effects of it coming into contact with humans are very well documented. Should SCP-352's enzyme reach human tissue, it will begin to rapidly attack the nervous system with symptoms that manifest in a number of unsettling and degenerative ways. Almost immediately, a person who so much as gets some of this enzyme on their skin will start to experience vivid hallucinations and will often have the logical part of their brain shut down, diminishing their cognitive ability and preventing them from thinking or acting rationally. The subject's pain receptors are also suppressed, meaning any serious injury will be unfelt and could potentially be life-threatening if left untreated. They will remain in this hallucinatory state for several days depending on the level of exposure to the enzyme they've experienced, but the higher the dosage carries the greater likelihood of this manic state becoming permanent. One bite from SCP-352 is enough to achieve this result, driving its victims into a delirium where they can trust neither the things their eyes are seeing or the thoughts in their own brain. According to research conducted by the Foundation into SCP-352's habits, the creature sustains itself on a carnivorous diet, its main and preferred source of food being human flesh. And slowly, you're probably starting to put these different aspects of SCP-352 together into one gruesome picture. Like several strands spun together into a particularly unsettling web, almost exactly like the kind that SCP-352 weaves to catch its prey. Much like a spider, SCP-352 uses the threads produced by her body to create a web of hair, waiting for her prey to stumble into it. By exposing them to the enzyme in her saliva, she can cause them to rapidly become docile, aided particularly by the enzyme's hallucinogenic and pain-numbing properties. Once they've been bitten or otherwise suffered exposure to the enzyme, SCP-352 will trap her victim and begin to devour them. As has been observed by Foundation personnel both during testings and during SCP-352's discovery, she doesn't like her prey running away. As such, the anomalous old woman will often begin by completely disabling and incapacitating them. She then spends the following few days gradually eating her human prey until there is nothing left of them. Despite the horrific, stomach-churning images of SCP-352 eating someone being positively traumatizing to anyone unlucky enough to witness it, the victims themselves are often docile throughout the grisly process. Thanks to the enzyme in their systems, these unfortunate persons are often numb to the painful sensations and often experience an elevated rush of dopamine instead of the intense fear you might expect from a person being devoured by a decrepit old lady. Most of SCP-352's victims display a lack of awareness of their surroundings, with no knowledge of the outside world as they suffer their own ingestion and eventual demise. Before the Foundation had a chance to observe all of this firsthand, reports of an enchanted forest were responsible for drawing their attention to a small township in southern Russia. According to the local stories circulating at the time, a witch had been responsible for the deaths of several people nearby. But it wasn't until word of this supposed witch's capture reached them that the Foundation decided to take a closer look and send in a team to investigate. A recovery team arrived in southern Russia, expecting to find the captured anomaly and some townspeople up in arms at the perpetrator of the recent deaths. Instead, they arrived to discover the area was deserted, not a living soul in sight. As they fanned out to explore the area, the first of the unsettling discoveries soon presented itself. A number of dead bodies in various states of decay. The smell was unbearable, but what was worse was there was no sign of the so-called witch. They soon happened across a clue as to where she might be, though. There was a trail of blood in the snow, leading from the town towards the forest at its outskirts. The shape and direction of the blood seemed to indicate that the bodies were dragged in the direction of the forest, the same place the locals had reported was enchanted. Venturing away from the small, frost-bitten town, the Foundation recovery team were surrounded on all sides by dense trees, dustings of ice over their crystallized leaves and branches. They searched the area, each footstep embedded in the snow with a crunch. Following the blood trail, one of the group, further away from the others, swore he felt something brush against his skin. He waved it away. It was just a cobweb. Or rather, it was just like a cobweb. Before long, the main group had lost contact with him and huddled together while sending out one of their number to retrieve their missing fellow agent. The Foundation operative traversed the forest until the sounds of snarling and crunching caught his attention. It was not the soft sound of snow underfoot. This was the brittle gnawing and snapping of bone against teeth. 
He peered out from behind a tree, and through a net of almost invisible threads hanging between them was an elderly figure crouched over the missing agent, devouring him alive. The operative muttered under his breath, the words exiting in a plume of warm fog in front of his face. Baba Yaga. A number of additional recovery teams were soon sent in by the Foundation to retrieve the anomaly. Thanks to multiple cases of exposure to the enzyme, heavy casualties were incurred before SCP-352 was eventually captured and brought back to the Foundation. Recovery teams also discovered a large quantity of the hair-like threads, enough to form a web that covered most of the forest. It quickly became apparent that this was responsible for the incidents of Foundation agents falling prey to SCP-352, with most writing off any contact with the threads as either the feeling of their own hair or spider webs against their skin. As of now, the anomaly designated as SCP-352 is kept in a sealed containment area at all times. Direct interaction with her is strictly prohibited, unless carried out via remote means, such as through security cameras. If human personnel are required to interact with SCP-352 under any extenuating circumstances, then full hazmat protocol is to be observed at all times. Anyone exhibiting erratic behavior or showing any indications of hallucinations must be placed in immediate quarantine and tested for enzyme contamination. If any personnel are bitten by SCP-352, they are to be abandoned. SCP-352 is fed once a week, a more efficient food source, employing the use of SCP-604 or SCP-1680, is still being reviewed and pending approval from the site director. In the meantime, the Baba Yaga still needs to eat, and there's only one thing that she's shown a preference for. All he could see were glimpses, flashes of movement, but he could clearly make out that there was a girl. He could see the man walk up behind her and slip a bag over her head. There was a struggle, a body being dragged through the dark, and then the sound of a shovel scraping against the hard dirt. The body is thrown into the shallow hole, and as the dirt begins to rain down on her face, her eye opens up. The boy's eyes open too, and he sits up with a panicked jolt. Shaky and covered in sweat, he looks around his dark room and realizes that it was only a dream. The entire morning as the boy gets ready, rides the bus, and sits through school, all he can think about is the dream and the girl. A group of teenage girls are out for a ride in one of their father's sports car convertible. They're having too much fun and driving much too fast down the dark country roads. It doesn't take much, it never does. Just the shadow of an animal bolting across the road, but it's enough to make the driver jerk the wheel, causing the car to lose control. All of the girls scream, but none more than the one who is tossed from the sliding, spinning car. The girls stand around their dead friend and make a solemn pact. No one here will ever know that she was with them. But what will they do with her? One of them points towards the woods, and everyone turns to look at the dilapidated shed. As the girls, now dirty from their long night of digging and then filling a hole, emerge from the shed into the dim morning light, none of them are aware that beneath the dirt, the girl is still breathing. The boy gasps for air and struggles in the dark. He throws the blankets off of him before realizing that he is safe in his own bed. Another breakfast, another ride to school, another day of classes where the boy can think of nothing but the girl from his dreams. Who is she? He's never seen her in his life, he's sure of it. But then why does she keep appearing in his dreams? The boy is snapped out of his deep train of thought by the teacher slapping his desk, and he apologizes before focusing on his studies once again. The look on the woman's face is a mix of sadness and annoyance. She doesn't know how much longer she can go on like this. It never stops. How can someone cough so much? The woman sits in her chair and tries to push away the same thought that comes to her over and over, that it would be better for both of them if it would just end. The girl coughs loudly in her bed. The disease has ravaged her lungs, and it takes all of her willpower not to scratch at the burning, itching sores on her face and chest. She looks towards the door with dazed eyes and sees her mother enter the room. She's carrying a tray with soup, just like she always does at this time, even though she has no appetite at all. As her mother gets closer, she can see that the tray is empty, and it isn't a tray in her hands. It's a pillow. The girl can barely muster a scream as the woman places the pillow over her daughter's face. As the mother walks out of the old shed in the backyard and towards the house, she stops for a moment. Can she hear the sound of coughing coming from the shed? 
That morning at breakfast, the boy's father tells him in no uncertain terms that he doesn't want to hear any more about the girl. It's just a dream and he needs to put it out of his mind. What he needs to be focusing on is school. The note from his teacher said that he isn't paying attention in class, and if that keeps up, he's going to have much bigger problems. The boy promises, no more about the girl. As the boy stares out the bus window, it isn't his fault that thoughts about his dream rush into his head. Because as the bus drives along the country roads, he catches a glimpse of something down a long, tree-covered driveway. It's the house from his dream. The shed door opens with a creak, allowing a sliver of light from the full moon to fall inside. The boy enters the shed as quietly as he can and goes inside. He soon emerges with his bike and a shovel strapped to his back before riding away from his own backyard into the night. The boy stops his bike at the bottom of the driveway leading up to the old abandoned house. He rides up the drive and doesn't even consider stopping at the house. His destination is somewhere else. The boy lets his bike fall to the ground in the backyard and stares at it. It's the shed he's seen so many times before, despite never seeing it in person. It's dark and quiet, the shed silhouetted against the large, bright moon. He approaches the only door on the small shed and reaches for the handle. It opens with a loud, rusty squeak. The boy takes out a flashlight and turns it on, illuminating the shed's interior. Inside is nothing except for a wooden bench sitting on the dirt floor. But wait, there is something else. A spot on the ground appears different, blackened, almost as if it were burned. This is the spot, though. This is the place the boy keeps seeing in his dreams. He knows she's down there. She needs his help. The boy thrusts his shovel down into the dirt, but it doesn't even scratch the surface. The ground is cold and hard. He strikes down again, and the shovel pierces into the dirt. The shovel suddenly falls to the ground, though, as the boy begins to cough. He drops to his knees as the coughing becomes a fit. He can't stop, and now he can't breathe. It feels like his throat is filling with something. He falls to the ground, still coughing as he feels whatever is filling his throat and lungs moving and vibrating. The final great hacking cough, he unleashes a swarm of creatures from his mouth. He lies in the dirt, struggling but unable to get any air, as the buzz of thousands of locusts drowns out his final noises. It's no surprise that what this young man ran into wasn't a dream at all, but an interaction with an anomaly that has since been classified as SCP-4595 but also has the quite simple and appropriate name of Witch. SCP-4595 is the designation given to a small room located inside of a woodshed that is itself found behind a home near the town of Jasper, Indiana. The house appears to have been abandoned for some time, and there are no reliable records of who the home's most recent or original owners were. The only item inside the woodshed is a simple, rough-hewn wooden bench, though at the time of the anomaly's discovery, Two other objects were found as well. The first was a small shovel, the type that might be used for gardening. The shovel appears to be ordinary in every way, except for the very tip which has what looks to be a blood stain on it, though tests have been unable to retrieve any genetic material from the discoloration. The second object was a small human skeleton. The body of the deceased person was removed from the woodshed, and an autopsy revealed that it had belonged to an adolescent male, roughly 11 to 13 years old. While the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, it is extremely likely that it was due to the anomalous effects that SCP-4595 produces, but more on those in a moment. Further examination of the woodshed reveals that the word witch has been scrawled on the door with charcoal, though it is unknown who wrote the message and whether it is meant to serve as a warning or has some other purpose. It is highly likely, though, that the word is referring to the final element of SCP-4595, the body that is buried beneath the woodshed's dirt floor. Ground-penetrating imaging tools were brought in to investigate the shed, and researchers discovered that underneath one portion of the floor that appears to have been scorched at some point, a body is buried roughly one meter beneath the surface, which has since been designated as SCP-4595-A. Scans have revealed the body to be a humanoid figure, vaguely feminine in appearance. Its limbs are twisted in a painful and unnatural manner, there are several large wounds present on its face, chest, and neck. But perhaps strangest of all is that despite evidence at the site pointing to the location not having been disturbed for many years, the corpse buried beneath does not seem to show any signs at all of decomposition, still appearing as it most likely did at the time it was interred in the ground. You are most likely asking yourself why the SCP Foundation has relied solely on subterranean imaging in order to assess the state of SCP-4595-A 
and why they don't simply dig up the anomalous corpse. The reason why they haven't is due to the anomalous effects present at the site. Testing on SCP-4595 has concluded that anyone who enters the shed and remains there for any substantial amount of time will begin to experience a number of effects. First, they will start to feel paranoid, getting the impression that someone is watching them. This purely mental effect is quickly followed by a physical one, where the individual's skin will start to itch. Those who linger in SCP-4595 long enough will eventually begin to violently scratch at themselves in an attempt to relieve the itchiness. These effects, while very uncomfortable, will eventually subside if they leave the location, and it is very likely that they are meant to serve as a warning of what will happen if one partakes in the most dangerous aspect of SCP-4595, which is disturbing the body buried beneath it. Anyone who attempts to impact SCP-4595-A by attempting to dig it up or otherwise remove it from the location will quickly experience a horrendous anomalous effect. The individual will soon find that they are experiencing a shortness of breath and soon will begin coughing and choking and be unable to breathe at all. This is due to a phenomenon in which any empty space in their chest cavity, lungs, airways, stomach, and intestines will completely fill with Schistocerca gregaria, better known as the desert locust. The insects will continue to appear within the individual's body until they expire, a process that typically takes mere minutes. Any locusts that manage to escape the individual's body, most often through the mouth and nose, will disappear into a vapor that quickly dissipates the moment they cross the threshold of the woodshed's doorway. So far, no method has been determined that can prevent any of SCP-4595's effects, and for the time being, no personnel are allowed to enter the anomalous shed except for testing purposes, but even in those cases, the disturbance of SCP-4595-A is not allowed. Due to the relative ease with which the Foundation can secure the site and is able to prevent anyone from entering, it has been classified as safe, with the additional disruption class of dark and the risk class of warning. Just what is SCP-4595? Is the SCP-4595-A body a victim, doomed to an eternity beneath this ramshackle shed? Or is it a monster, sealed away for some unknown purpose, the only warning for us to stay away being a single word on the door? Maybe one day we'll finally know the answer to why SCP-4595 is only known as the Witch. It's 1937, and a machete hacks through a clump of vines, clearing a path for famed adventurer, world-renowned treasure hunter, and charming scoundrel, Drake Jonesy O'Connolly. Of course, all his reputation is as greatly exaggerated as the swagger with which he strides through the rainforest. All the actual adventuring and uncovering of ancient artifacts is really the work of Jonesy's counterpart, Evie Croftsworth, a brilliant Oxford-educated archaeologist who tails behind him as he leads the way. Despite not being the one holding the map, Evie sighs as she sees Jonesy looking around for which route to take next. She only really tolerates him because he comes in handy when other rival treasure hunters start shooting at them. Jonesy has a miraculous habit of attracting bullets, luckily for her. The pair have journeyed across more of the globe together than most people will ever see in their lifetimes, tracking down buried treasures and the remnants of ancient civilizations lost to time. For Evie, it is a purely educational pursuit. She does it to preserve knowledge and put the items they find into the hands of fellow scholars so that her findings might one day wind up in museums. Jonesy is here solely for the money and the thrill of the adventure that makes it worth occasionally being shot at. After successfully recovering an ancient casket that was said to contain the wrath of God himself from an underground tomb, the intrepid pair have arrived at their next destination. Jetting halfway around the world to hike through the humid rainforest is hardly cheap or easy, especially in the 1930s. But thanks to the wealth bequeathed to Evie by her late family and Jonesy's connections with various pilots and smugglers, they've arrived to track down the ruins of a temple that's supposedly hidden in this particular area of rainforest. Fragments of a map were delivered to one of the museum owners Evie works with, and once she had confirmed their legitimacy, it seemed like exactly the kind of mystery her and her admittedly useful but ultimately loudish partner could solve. Once fully translated, the map spoke of part of the rainforest that seemed to have been cursed. According to scrawls left on the torn parchment, it had something to do with a high priest at the temple that lay in the heart of the trees. Apparently, to keep the temple safe from interlopers, the high priest had cast a spell to bring the surrounding trees to life, compelling them to attack anyone who ventured close to the temple. That was the legend, at least. Based on where Evie judges their current position to be, they aren't far now. 
and there's been no sign of killer trees. Not yet, anyway. She directs Jonesy, who starts up cleaving the foliage around them with his machete, clearly not compensating for anything. The two of them venture further into the rainforest, trying to at least locate the ruined temple before nightfall. Even if they can't get inside by the time it gets dark, they can set up camp nearby and try to gain access in the morning. But despite her expert navigational skills, Evie can't locate the temple. She stops, tries to get her bearings, but each time either Jonesy's inane comments throw her off kilter, or she gets the exact latitude and longitude muddled. The heat and humidity of the rainforest aren't helping, neither is the fact that the pair of them are both exhausted from a long day's hike. Add to that the fact that all Evie has to work off of is the only surviving pieces of an inaccurate map from centuries ago, and the whole expedition is starting to feel like it's falling apart. Night begins to fall, and no closer to finding the temple, the pair decide to set up their individual tents and bed down for the night. In the morning, they'll be able to think clearer, having had some sleep. But throughout the whole night, Evie is restless. She's convinced that she followed the map accurately, even accounting for any margins of error. They should be at the temple already, by now she's an expert at this. Hell, even Jonesy has at least learned a few things from their many adventures. Speaking of Jonesy, she's set up her tent too close to his again. Unable to sleep because of her overactive thoughts, being able to hear him snore isn't helping Evie get any rest either. The tent flap opens and Jonesy walks a few feet away. How typical that the natural beauty of this rainforest should be made into this man's latrine. The first few minutes of quiet pass, the rainforest is still. And laying in her tent, Evie suddenly realizes what's wrong with that. The place should be teeming with wildlife. They should be able to hear birds calling from the treetops or the flap of their wings from overhead. But there's nothing. Distressed at having only just noticed this, Evie gets up and scrambles out of her tent, grabbing a flashlight and calling out to Jonesy. She spots him standing a few feet away, his back to her, and rushes over. The whole time she's hurriedly explaining what she's just realized, worried that there might well be something else in the rainforest, a predator that scared all the wildlife away that could have led whoever made the map to believe the place was cursed. Only once she stops talking, Evie notices Jonesy hasn't moved. He's as unnervingly still as the rest of the rainforest. The beam of Evie's flashlight catches something, a long strand reaching down from the treetops, winding its way around Jonesy's arms. She follows it with the light up and up towards the branches, and Evie screams in horror at what she sees above them. Several decades pass, even the turn of a millennium, and the names of Evie Croftsworth and Drake O'Connolly are as lost to time as the treasures they once spent their lives searching for. Then, one day, the area of rainforest they vanished in starts experiencing heavy deforestation. Trees are being sawed down and toppled to clear the way for construction crews, reducing the size of the rainforest to allow for yet more people to inhabit the area. Why? That's because typically, where there are people, there are ways for corporations to make profits. Of course, as is the case with any deforestation effort, the upfront cost is normally paid by the unfortunate wildlife in the area, though often the trees being cut down and animals being evicted from their homes aren't able to fight back against humans destroying their habitat, most of the time, at least. Concerned reports are spreading through the workers as they're following orders to chop down trees. Eventually, word reaches the foreman at the head of the operation. The men have been whispering that two of the advanced parties scouting ahead into the rainforest haven't checked in for quite some time. The foreman sighs, he's been expecting trouble since the job started. He works for the company responsible for bankrolling the deforestation effort, whose investment dollars will be funding the construction that all this natural beauty is standing in the way of. Given that wiping out large swathes of the rainforest to build hotels or oil pipelines is typically frowned upon by some people, and not to mention the environment not always being conducive to safety, the company often turns to dubious methods to keep its tree-cutting crews protected. That job gets outsourced to mercenaries, private military contractors whose sense of morality and ethics are a lot more pliable, especially when offered large sums of money. Their role is usually to scare off locals, both the wildlife and human varieties, as well as deterring peaceful protesters who decide to make their objection to the destruction of the rainforest known. Working with armed soldiers of fortune isn't for everyone, hence the tension the foreman has been feeling since the operation had begun. 
Now, according to his tree cutters, some of these company-provided mercenaries are missing in the rainforest, and everyone's looking to the foreman to figure out what to do. He can't halt his men from chopping down trees to go and search for the missing mercenaries. He knows the company has strict deadlines they want to keep to. And sending the remaining soldiers away to conduct a sweep of the area leaves his tree-cutting crew unprotected against wild animals or people with understandable moral objections to destroying the rainforest. Short on time and options, the foreman decides on a combination of the only two available to him. He gathers a small group, half comprised of the remaining mercenaries, the other half taken from his cutters, and leads them off into the rainforest in search of the rest of the missing security detail. Hours spent trudging through the unbearably humid rainforest yielded no sign of the advance teams. Eventually, as the sun starts falling behind the tree line, the foreman is forced to make the decision to call off the search. Two days pass, with each one seeing the foreman once again rounding up the same mix of mercenaries and tree cutters to continue the search, but to no avail. Until the second day following the advance team's disappearances, Fanning out to cover more ground, some of the leftover mercenaries aiding in the search effort suddenly spot a pair of the advance squads resting against the large buttress roots of a Seba tree. The mercenaries call out to their comrades, knowing the pair of them must be exhausted and likely both dehydrated and starving after two days with only their canteens and emergency rations to depend on. But there's no response. The mercenary units call out a second time, yet still the men propped up against the large tree don't budge. Then, one moves. Even at a distance, it's clear that he's waving his fellow mercenaries over for assistance. One or both of them could be injured, so the soldiers of the search team rush over, only to wish they hadn't. As they approach, they can see the pair of mercenaries closer. What looks to be thin vines are reaching down and pulling at the arms of both of their missing comrades, manipulating them like the strings of a marionette puppet. Something is very, very wrong here. The call goes out to the foreman and the rest of the search party. Mercenaries trained as field medics are brought over and told to examine the two men, still suspended by the strange vines pulling at their arms. Drawing closer, the medics step on what they think are just more vines strewn about the rainforest floor. But those aren't vines. The newspaper reports blame a spate of disappearances when the deforestation operation shuts down. Those living nearby breathe a collective sigh of relief that the company after losing 11 of their cutters and mercenaries, decided to withdraw from the rainforest. Their official statement calls it a temporary suspension of the project, but doesn't reveal to the public the truth, that the tree crews and mercenaries who had returned outright refused to go back. Every one of them seems too traumatized by what they've seen to even consider it, no matter how much compensation the company offers. Many resign altogether, many of the tree cutters walking out on the spot while the mercenaries move on to new contracts. The same headlines reporting on the incident soon make it to the SCP Foundation, who dispatch their own team to investigate. Mobile task force operators are far better equipped than ragtag mercenaries, and they know not to wander too far into unfamiliar territory. What they find leads to a total quarantine of the rainforest, 14 specimens of giant flying jellyfish. As anomalous species go, Few are as unnerving as SCP-1158, otherwise known as the Arboreal Puppeteers, or by their far more simplistic description, the Flying Killer Jellyfish. As you might expect from a name like that, these anomalous invertebrates bear a striking resemblance to a pre-existing marine species, the Physalia fissilis, or Portuguese man-o-war colloquially. Despite often being referred to as jellyfish, the Portuguese man-o-war actually belongs to a group of animals called siphonophores. These are closely related to jellyfish. However, where jellyfish are singular organisms, siphonophores are a colony of genetically identical zooids. In other words, a group of clones that work together as one, with each performing a specific function to facilitate survival. SCP-1158 shares the same attributes of siphonophores, with each of its various parts being responsible for certain tasks. The one major difference is that, while siphonophores are a form of marine life typically found in deep-sea locations, SCP-1158 has a far different natural habitat, the rainforest. That's right, these jellyfish are found dwelling in treetops. However, much like the species of Australian bears that are rumored to drop from branches to attack human tourists from above, 
the habitat of SCP-1158 seems limited to a specific area, specifically a 500-kilometer radius of rainforest that surrounds a location that has been redacted by the SCP Foundation. While redaction makes it unclear where this region is, the Foundation's database entry regarding the anomaly does mention the presence of Saba trees in the area. This leads to the assumption that the first encounter with an instance of SCP-1158 could have taken place in any rainforest-dense area where Saba trees are native. These possible locations include Mexico, Central America, the northern part of South America, the Caribbean, or West Africa. Another smaller variety of Saba is also found in certain areas of South and Southeast Asia. The specimens of SCP-1158 are brought back to the Foundation for examination. For one, Foundation researchers need to ascertain exactly what happened to the deforestation crew. For another, it's rare to see jellyfish this big. Most specimens of the non-anomalous Portuguese man-o-war can, on average, grow to between 30 and 100 feet long from the float down to the tips of its numerous strands of tentacles and polyps. By comparison, the pneumatophore alone, the gas-filled float that the polyps are attached to, of the captured SCP-1158 specimens is around 13 feet tall. These aren't just large jellyfish, they're enormous. Foundation testing reveals that each SCP-1158 instance has a concentrated amount of hydrogen within its pneumatophore. Thought to have been produced as a byproduct of bacterial decay, the resultant hydrogen gas provides each creature with lift, allowing them to float upwards to a degree, like balloons, although perhaps not the kind you'd want at a birthday party, unless you really didn't like the guests. Once airborne, these olive drab invertebrates will nest themselves in the high up treetops of taller rainforest flora typically remaining hidden just beneath the foliage and allowing its polyps to hang down through the branches, with most being long enough to reach the forest floor, even at higher elevations. Given the coloration of each instance of SCP-1158, the creature seems to have evolved in such a way that they have a natural camouflage, allowing their tentacles to blend in with the various vines that typically hang from certain varieties of trees found in the rainforest. SCP-1158's tentacles are far from vestigial, but nor are they, strictly speaking, limbs that can be used in the same way that a human being's arms or legs function. They are polyps, the collection of genetically identical parts possessed by siphonophores. Each of these performs a specific function, and SCP-1158's dactylozoids polyp bundles, for example, are their defensive polyps. These are somewhat prehensile, meaning that they can be moved to a limited degree. Those that reach down from the treetops and remain camouflaged among vines are the polyps responsible for detection and feeding. The primary prey of SCP-1158 is limited to mammals and reptiles. Any animal at around 50 kilograms in mass or more that the creature detects will be targeted for the jellyfish to feed on. This occurs when a victim comes into contact with the defensive dactylozoid polyps, which are commonly laying on the ground or against a tree where an SCP-1158 instance is nesting. When this happens, prey are captured by these specialized polyps and subjected to an injection of a paralyzing neurotoxin that is produced within the nematocysts of an SCP-1158's dactylozoid polyps. With their target rendered immobile thanks to the neurotoxin, the SCP-1158 instance will wrap its nearby polyp threads around the victim and restrain them. As if that wasn't bad enough, this is where the process gets even more unpleasant. It takes approximately six seconds for one of these flying killer jellyfish to poison and ensnare one of its victims, after which time the creature's primary feeding polyps are deployed. These will enter the jellyfish's prey, typically via the mouth or ears, then release powerful digestive enzymes to disintegrate the target's internal organs. The resultant mess is absorbed directly by the polyps, effectively hollowing out an animal, or a person, from the inside. This process can go on for approximately four excruciating days. The only consolation is that usually SCP-1158's target is dead after just two. If at any point the creature's prey is approached by others, the polyps will trigger a muscular spasm that causes the victim to stand on its hind legs and wave its front legs. When SCP-1158 eats a human, this motion can be perceived as a beckoning gesture or one motioning other humans to come closer which is exactly what the mercenaries saw the two stuck squad mates doing, hence the alternate name for SCP-1158, the Arboreal Jellyfish Puppeteers. 
Two weeks of testing pass after the specimens of SCP-1158 are brought to the Foundation. After this time, the creatures are placed in their containment habitat at Site-19's Hazardous Life Forms wing. Within the enclosure is a near-perfect recreation of the rainforest the jellyfish were found in. The temperature and humidity are kept at just the right levels, maintained by Foundation personnel. Throughout the habitat are sensor pods, observing the jellyfish. In the interest of watching their behavioral and feeding patterns, researchers introduce a live adult domestic pig into the enclosure to act as prey for the 14 SCP-1158 instances inside. The experiment does not go well. At first, the pig just wanders around, exploring its newfound environment, until eventually it finds itself caught in the polyps of an SCP-1158 specimen. As to be expected, the dactylozoid polyps begin to administer the neurotoxin in order to commence the unpleasant feeding process. But for reasons unknown, it doesn't work. Instead, the pig, despite being initially startled and squealing in fear, starts to free itself from the giant jellyfish by biting its way out. The pig is able to chew its way through the strands of polyps without suffering the paralyzing effects of SCP-1158's neurotoxin. And then, upon being dropped back to freedom, it grips the remainder of the creature's vine-like appendages in its mouth. The pig pulls the flying killer jellyfish down from the safety of the canopy up in the treetops, then tramples them to death, eating what's left behind. Overall, six specimens are lost as a result. Baffling Foundation researchers, all species of pig they test seem to be completely unaffected by the jellyfish's neurotoxin. The reason for this remains unknown. Instead, the Foundation introduces one live adult sheep to the remaining eight SCP-1158 instances every 21 days in order to allow the creatures to feed. Should maintenance be required within the enclosure, then SCP-1158's habitat is accessed via a positive pressure airlock. On a weekly basis, Foundation staff are sent in wearing Tyvek exposure suits to protect against chemical threats, in particular the neurotoxin produced by the jellyfish's defensive polyps. Maintenance teams are accompanied by mobile task force operatives armed with standard issue M1014 shotguns and are permitted to use lethal force should any of the specimens of SCP-1158 become aggressive. All Foundation personnel assigned to enter the enclosure seem to concur that, despite the humidity, it's fine as long as you don't look up at what's in the trees. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2846, The Squid and the Sailor.